Welcome to the answer to life, the universe, and everything, but minus one, I guess. It's episode 41. We're not quite there yet, but we've got the regular crew plus a little himbo. What's he doing? <laughs> With his ears sticking out. I'm, like part, little... I'm part of the regular crew already. It's yes, just the himbo true. hat. Except, <laughs> except you're wearing a himbo hat. So you What's don't look like a member of the regular crew. What's wrong crew. with that? It's you look like a nice. little dumb Christmas elf. <laughs> Uh, Bryn has a matching one with me. He's got to the black fair, version. To be fair, last episode, you all two look like Christmas elves with your yeah. sweatshirts. So I don't know if you yeah. guys are. We've managed to actually not sync our outfits today. No. You're wearing the chain, you know, classic drip, and uh, the, tr the charcoal gray, furry flower on your chest. Yeah, and you got the classic. You got the fisherman knit. Sideshow loves a yeah. fisherman knit sweater. I do. That's one thing I know about you. Yep, so we met. Yeah, we we didn't do the matching thing. Yeah. Today. Also, but though, he's this, the guy with the exotic fish. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we US. just got demonetized. Wait, I was so distracted by Josh's rip in his sweater that he just showed me. He just <laughs> lifted up his arm and exposed his, his armpit to yeah, me. Yeah, I mean, That's I noticed it missed. when I put it on this morning, and I was like, is that going to stop me? No, it's just more <laughs> air flowing through. <laughs> Not a bad situation whatsoever. Now, our first piece of news, we thankfully managed to catch this before. I mean, I say we've managed to catch it. They've probably released more since you, you've been able to tune into this premiere, but... It's a new map. It's called Breeze, and it yep. looks mm, like paradise. <laughs> Good intro. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Can we bring up the screen? Kurt, Kurt wouldn't let us look at the screenshots. He demanded a real reaction live. Oh, I mean, castle. There's yeah. a ladder. Surely, Is that the gimmick? Surely you can't go up that ladder. Well, that's I mean, that ladder, well, how would that, how would that, I mean, look at it. It just doesn't even go anywhere. It would just be like a spot to sit on and look over. <laughs> it and goes then you're to stuck the on like, <laughs> What are you talking about? Yeah, it goes right <laughs> to the ramper where you get into the cannon. And <laughs> yeah, wow. I'm saying. We're gonna, you guys were being serious for a second. I was like, am I missing something? Like, no, we're going to, we're going to, this is, it was a good suggestion from you. We're going to try and spot the gimmick. Guess the gimmick. What is the gimmick of this map? Because they always have one, right? On, uh, on bind is the teleport. Orders. Split was apparently the ropes, although I think actually it being defensive sided is uh, like fucking eighty percent was really the gimmick. Um, uh, yeah, this one's got to have something, right? All right, what is that? Like a big tower of radionite in the background? Yeah, that's what I was yeah. looking at too. Looks like there's a turret or something, something inside of there. Turrets, it's really nice. Maybe maybe <gasps> you're not allowed to go into certain areas until you've deactivated the turrets. <laughs> All right, next next no. screen, next screen. Ooh. There's a boat. Don't think you can get to the boat, though. Well, what? are you Why sure not? you can't swim, swim on this map? You can swim? They've added swimming. If the gimmick is swimming... They did that in the, Fortnite. If the gimmick is swimming, get it out the game. Get it out the game. <laughs> what's wrong with... Why? Preemptively, get it out the game. I want to hear what's wrong with it. What's wrong with swimming? Yeah, what's wrong yeah, with what's swimming wrong with in Valorant? Are you going to be accurate while swimming? Are you bobbing around in the yes. water? Yeah, of you're bobbing you around. Will. No, the accuracy is a little bit off. It's a so little it's like bit off. It's like being on the ropes. It's like, it's like walking and spraying. Where, we where's... know there's no problems with that either, so surely this will be fine. <laughs> so where's, yeah. where's the limit to the map? If you go to the beach, you get in the water. How far out can you get with an op? It's Good just question. an open world RPG now. Is that, the gimmick? Is that want. the gimmick now? You can just travel. You can just I mean, fast travel to a different escape, location. So I'm assuming you can just go to a sense or something. You can drive <laughs> I mean, the yacht. <laughs> look, they would. That has to be. That has to be a plant site, right there. Right. What on the yacht? Yes. How do you get to the yacht? I'm swimming. A cannon. <laughs> You're not swimming. I don't know what this is like. Or the cannon. I think that's a great Yo, suggestion. You get actually, in the cannon, and then your teammate fires you over. Uh, it's a good way to take some space. It's like it's like in StarCraft Island maps where you can't get to specific spots until you actually develop the tech. In this case, it's a cannon. That's the gimmick of the map. You actually have to develop technology. So you climb up the ladder to get to the ramparts, to get in the cannon, <clears throat> to shoot yourself to the yacht. Yeah. That is genius. It's okay. so hard to retake when the when the attacking team pulls that one off. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually oh. there, there was actually like a uh, like a I don't know manor in the background there. I wonder if that's playable too. Wait, Anyways. go back. Show me the manor. Was there a manor? The manor. Where, where you oh, there it is. Ooh. Yeah, oh. the chateau. Ah, interesting. Yeah, I feel like we're looking. Oh, enhanced. Jeez. <laughs> 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 Not, wait, what's in what's in now I just want to enhance everything. Kurt, enhance the yacht. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
this, no one is going to clean any sort of Do you think there's going to be more detail when I zoom this? in? Yeah, and hands on the yacht, please. <laughs> There is literally zero is information oh, to be there. Learned. We go. <laughs> What's mm. that in the background behind the yacht? That's what I'm looking. It's no, a like, pier. Oh, down by it's the a dock. pier. That's a pier. That's a you, pier. Okay. Well, it's pier. hard to see. You plankton. It's hard to. see. <laughs> 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 it's not like it. it why? It's, well, oh man, so much good information, guys. I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready for the pier in Breeze. It's gonna be a huge part of the map. You take it to the chateau, then you go on your open world RPG. You get on your horse, you call it, and you go to the next. No, location. this is actually what that actually is. Guarantee. Hold on. Go back. Yeah. Oh my lord. All right. No, on. no. This is uh, this is one of the spawns. You can see the castle is on the left there, right? Right. You spawn, and that's the scenery behind you. Yep. Guarantee. Agreed. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Guarantee. Sure. Probably. Probably. That's, that's my yeah, I feel like hot prediction. We're looking at the outside of the map right now, surely, because it is the yeah. ocean. The first it, the first screenshot was in the map. Yes. Probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. These yeah. two... That looks so playable. This is inside in fact, the chateau. I'm pretty sure we have those stairs somewhere already. Yeah. Okay, so that what is the final so one? It, we've, got a, we've got a tire swing there. Yeah. Can we, can, yeah. No, that is that going to be, be part gimmick. of the gimmick? It could be. Oh my god, finally, they're adding apes to Valorant? <laughs> Finally, it's time. The, it could be a new agent tease, right? Mm. What would the no, agent be? Oh yeah, like return to no, stop. <laughs> return to monkey society <laughs> agent. <laughs> great game, great game. That's the swing that Sky is swinging in in her portrait. Boom. Oh. Is Sky swinging in her portrait? I didn't, even know I didn't she was even, doing that, but I believe that is it. some. That is some like fucking. Yeah, wait, so, in the... so are we? Are you theorizing that this is Australia? Because I don't think they have oh chateaus like that in Australia, do they? They do, probably, maybe somewhere, just one. Well, it's maybe an island of chateau. Breeze, right? So I'm assuming it's like some some island, like St. John's or something. I don't know. Sure, <laughs> yeah, St. John's. That's what the I island know, is. I know about St. John's. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, we've all yep. we're all very familiar I, with St. John's. I grew think up there. That there was like a, a leaker who was like, "This map is taking place on this this island." I'm pretty sure that actually already happened, but I. Didn't listen enough to note it down in my brain. Well, yeah, neither did I. So no, we've, we've I lost that crucial that, piece so. of information. Was there any, when, any other crucial information on that last screenshot that we want to delve into? <laughs> <laughs> That's you and your rank teammates when you get to Breeze. There you go. You're going to be hanging out there. <laughs> I mean, this, I mean, surely this is just when you're looking off to the side, right? Yeah, I mean, I think this what, is you, the teaser for the next map. You, you, you the, want the terrain to be that rugged? You have to jump up and down all of the rocks while you're trying to fire your. I mean, that could be kind of cool. Around. You get up on the, you Maybe swim over to the rock. Gimmick. You get up and you take cover. You like looks like a Call of Duty map. Take cover. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, this That's can't a popular be popular game. This can't be a playable area. Don't <laughs> don't do this to me. Don't do this. I love I love the way that they look like terrible travel agent um, adverts. I think they've really nailed the style of this. Yeah. <laughs> Just discover, oh, like wonder, escape. It's well, the so real question good. is is this map going mm. to be better or worse received than Icebox? That's the real question. We don't even know, but I just have to say, like, that's the real question is are we going to have a, a problem where, like, the maps, some times when new maps get added to games, people are like, each of the maps have gotten progressively worse. But I hope this map is like, because honestly, I didn't think Icebox, Icebox was poorly received at first, and now people. Are okay with it so yeah. i wonder how this map's gonna go in terms of reception but obviously we don't know other than looking at screenshots i feel like people so. learn to deal with icebox rather than yeah rather than learn to love it i feel like it's a bit of uh they've been they've been beaten down into submission and now they that is a it. really that's just a very bleak mindset i have to say it's like you'll learn to love the map it's like some sort of like it's like some sort of like 16th century arranged marriage it's like you'll learn to love him and that's like us with icebox yeah that's how i feel with icebox whenever i watch it i'm like i appreciate you i don't love you but i appreciate you i think the map will be well received immediately just a fucking flaming hot take. You have no, you haven't seen the map before. Yeah, it looks great. It looks really good. I mean, they have fire swings. You know, they, they have a yacht. No, how can you? You're gonna go in, and the aesthetic of the map is gonna produce serotonin in your brain. And it does look like pretty. It. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Gen okay. Genuinely, yeah, all the maps that like, have this aesthetic in the past, like I'm thinking, D Chateau from CS, D Parenthesis. Like I fucking, I love those maps, even though they sucked. 
All right, here's maybe here's another question thing. as well. There's going to be six maps in the pool. Yep. At what point? What the? What should they do? about that because that is a problem for pro play it was a problem when we had four maps in the pool it's a problem when we're gonna have six maps in the pool as well hear me out for every match there's a virtual wheel that gets spun <laughs> and yes. one map gets randomly banned yeah and then you pick ban yeah. down from the five anything that includes a random number generator wheels <laughs> and it's and i think that's i'm all for it i love spinning wheels to determine shit i love spinning wheels I, How do you feel I about mean, that, Josh? I feel like entertainment factor through the roof there, <laughs> but actual strategic <laughs> I mean, eh, hey, strategy. Yeah, our pocket pick is split. Let's go into this map. We've prepped a lot of strats. <laughs> split is banned randomly on the wheel. Oh, well, fuck. Okay. That's literally the same exact situation as let's just do our pick ban phase and then the last two maps flip a coin. Like yeah, it's the yeah. exact same thing. Except it is just yeah. reverse. It's pretty much exactly the same. The um, What I'd like to see them do is wait to add this to pro play until they have another map. Yes. Agreed. 100%. Or, I actually, there was already somebody talking about that on Reddit, and I was like, yes, right. that's, that, that's the solution. And, and the other thing that I was going to say as well is, if they want to redesign any of the core maps that are in the game right now, and they're just waiting mm -hmm. for an opportunity, I would be take fine with out. that. Add Breeze in, take, let's use Icebox as the example, take Icebox out and rework some of it, you know, add some uh, changes to the way that some of the sites are designed to make them mm. more accessible, so that it doesn't play like a fucking... We push in, we get the plant, and then we bugger off kind of simulator. If you, if you want to rework Icebox, add Breeze in, take Icebox out, keep the map pool at five, and then re-add Icebox with the new map once you release the seventh. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see them try something like that. I think if they actually just add six maps to the pool, they've missed, they've missed it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that's the way to do it, though I do see like there, there's a lot of not only pro players, but just the community in general is rushing to get new maps into the game. I actually don't think we have that rush anymore. I think we still want new maps, but I think we'd be fine with just the five map or uh, what we have. Right. I think we'd be we'd be fine with that. The five map pool. Yeah. For a while. I, I mean, certainly this map should not be introduced before Iceland. Right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it would. I, I, there's no good way to solve the pick ban. No, of course there isn't. They but, would genuinely but go to something. That, I'm joking about the wheel, but that is genuinely something that mm -hmm. probably would happen. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Like, what do you, what but, do you even well, do? What, they did. There, there was like this weird thing when we had four maps where it was like we repeated a map in a best. Well, that's three? what they did in like, Korea. The, the, isn't that what oh, yeah, they actually? Well, that was did. first strike. They first, just they did. They genuinely spun a wheel they, they and had they no laid reason it out. We're to playing Haven yes. twice again. Yes, they had no reason to do that. That was a weird thing that Korea did. But yeah, back when we played four maps, if you played a BO5, you would, you would play one of the maps twice in the series, or you would give a map advantage if it was like a, you know, like a, um, a one team made it through the upper bracket. Um, the reason that I'm bringing that up as to like they shouldn't add it for Iceland is because they did do that for first strike. And I know that that's a different situation because they wanted to get to five as quickly as possible, but they still added Icebox before anyone was ready for it. And it just became a bit of a crapshoot as to whether or not like you were you were ready to do anything on the map. I didn't really see any quality icebox gameplay when it came to first strike. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I'd like to see them kind of relax on it. Maybe add it in for Masters three. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think That's by fair. the time we get to Champions, I would like to have a seven map pool. Just depends Especially on how I feel. The they best feel of fives are actually though, right? interesting. Like if they like, do they like for them? Is it going to be an advertiser tool to like put in the new map to advertise the game slash the map at Iceland? Or are they going to view it as like, we need to preserve competitive integrity? Because there's always that balance between like the game developer itself and the esports side. They've done a good job so far of denying the, the wishes of the marketing team to <laughs> shove <laughs> shit into tournaments. Have uh, they? Yeah, definitely. I mean, what, in what could have been, yeah, Sky could have been in first strike. Yoru could have been Sky in, was I don't know, in whatever, strike. second. Was she in first? Oh, she was in first strike at the end, but she wasn't at the beginning, and there was a break right. between. So that was actually fine. True. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think there was anything going on with Yoru, and then no, with Astra, they time. delayed again as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So. And the, they've yeah they've actually been good about not forcing patches through. They changed yeah, the all most the recent decision yeah. in North America as well. So yeah, yeah. I suppose yeah. I see what you're the what only you're the only thing is with maps so far the only thing that we've seen is icebox being added before first strike finals which so maybe maps 
we think that they might. But yeah, I, but I think that was them I'm, trying I'm to rush confident. to five so that they could play proper BO5 series. Because there was competitive integrity reasons yeah. to have a fifth map. Exactly. Yeah, right. All right, well, let's move on to some dumb drama, huh? This is dumb drama hour, and we're starting with the Pulitzer <laughs> Prize, which has... Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think Richard Lewis put his hat in the ring to try and collect that, the game in Pulitzer. Uh, I don't know whether any of you saw the interview... I've asked you were the one that wanted to hand out the game in Pulitzer. Do you feel like it's been I mean, so I didn't far? actually we discussed the interview pre-show a bit, so I didn't actually see it, but I have to say the more I've heard about this deep dive into the game in Pulitzer and doing the research, the least you know, the less interested I am to say this is deserving of a gaming Pulitzer. Like <laughs> I have like it just gets dumber with each like insight into it. To where, where like I'm not even like what before I was like oh they didn't know he was a cheater they were doing something unethical now it's like fraud was angry because he got cut from the team and I'm like well this isn't gaming pool anymore like this is this is just I'm not even that interested wow. anymore in fact they, just, they've sapped the joy they've sapped the joy from the whole thing he's he teases the journalists with a massive award potential and then he, when they uncover more information he decides it's no longer a big story. That's... Poor Richard Lewis. I what know. That? Oh. that guy was just I craving just your masses. award. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'll still hand it out, but it doesn't feel it just doesn't feel that good. You know, okay. it doesn't All feel right. like I was expecting something mega juicy. You know, yeah, I, I was expecting I'll... something you take a bite into it. And it explodes in your mouth with the richness. There were pieces of juice in the interview, but they weren't related to the ethics debacle. So the reason that he brought up ethics in the first. So let's let's get some some facts out of the interview. But I would encourage people to go and watch the interview if you're actually interested in this. Fraud, um, Fraud got brought into the team because Brax wanted him in, for starters. But then he was, you know, happy to continue with T1. He wasn't happy with how T1 actually operated and the management from above, like, sticking their nose into everything. But that, I think, is... That does tend to be the case in quite a lot of esports orgs. Like, that, you don't just give the coach full authority to run the team. At least not, not everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the ethics thing was not because he, he didn't know that the guy was a cheater up until it was literally just recently announced. Um, the ethics thing was about the fact that he felt that T1 and, and the, the parent org was over-promising and under-delivering. And he said at that point, it becomes not just incompetence, but it becomes unethical because you're asking, you're like promising too much to like sucker people in and then not actually giving them what you promised them. But at the end of the day, almost all of his concerns about it just came down to he didn't, he didn't, he thought that they were pretty incompetent with how they ran the team. Yeah, I mean, and and uh, I mean, I I do believe he brought up some points that were previously unheard, like in regards to uh, I don't know the team, like the team situation during first strike and them having to. <clears throat> Like play at the different locations, like at the uh, right, theater yeah. to have decent at the ping, at the Chinese theater to have decent ping. Yes, and yeah. I don't know. So he he was trying to bring up points to that effect, but I I, I think where I'm at with this now is I just like to uh, I'd like to hear from someone else if this if there's going to be any further <laughs> uh, discussion on this matter, or just even as to a, a second take on what's going on or what had happened with that, and still just. So many other mysteries with T1. It would be nice to hear from, but they don't say anything. But for you know, if if they did an interview like Dazed or Brax for that matter, yeah, or yeah. David Denis, etc. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I agree because the way that he was phrasing it, I mean, he was talking a lot in the interview about um, the internal dynamic within T1 as well uh, during mm -hmm. First Strike about talking to um, talking to dazed about how he was calling and the team not being a fan of how they were calling and so he had to get involved and try and shift that kind of dynamic within the team and he felt like he had a mandate because the players were apparently behind it and the uh, i don't know like the yeah it was it, it was a lot of a lot of stuff but no real point i think the thing that we were looking for was what was the reason that he brought up ethics to do with it all well, I think and, we got it. Yeah, but it's it was just very the satisfactory vague. answer that we were searching. Yeah, like for what is uh, what does over promise and under deliver mean? Were they over promising on salary and then saying like, oh, we're not actually giving this that? Like, what does that mean? Well, he was saying that they the had them in uh, inadequate Inglewood. housing situations in inadequate LA. Housing. 
um, they had inadequate Inglewood, internet. Like, yeah, they had no they, they were on that spectrum wave, that <laughs> that <laughs> discount spectrum yeah. internet. Yeah. Um, and it was yeah, th- I think those were some of the main problems that I didn't previously hear that he was bringing up mm-hmm. as to them being an incompetent owner. Um, he, the, he, but at the he, same he mentioned time, like stuff about gear and like promising like PCs and stuff like that, fiber and yada yada yada. But yeah. to me, it just sounds like something that always happens in pretty much every org, as far as I'm I'm aware. And then eventually, it states that they go to Hollywood anyways and get really nice, really nice apartments there or something. Yeah, so. it seems like they actually did work out a lot of the problems, but towards the latter end, when they'd already decided to part ways with fraud for various reasons. Also, it seems like the entire rift began because he just isn't a fan of um, management, of like red tape, of the non-old school way of running a team where it's just the guys and a coach who are doing it themselves. Like trying to add more structure seemed to be to him uh, uh, just blockages between him getting his job done. And he wasn't, he didn't feel like he was put in position to exercise authority and have accountability on I don't know, very, very odd, but if you're interested, go and watch the interview as well, because it was long and thorough. Lower yep. third god. That's it. Let's move on. Honestly, <laughs> right. before I would be willing to rant on this for an hour, just to t- think, just to sniff out the juice, but now I've grown weary. Well, yeah. I, I, I wish to rest. Somehow. You are like so. a you are like a truffle pig, which is oversated, and you <laughs> yes, you've rolled onto your me. back and gone. Eh, no more, I cannot yep. sniff the truffles that's, anymore. That's the exact imagery that I would use, in fact, to describe myself. <laughs> okay, well, onto onto a more serious topic here. After the fraud um, ethics conspiracy, an actual ethical problem within the scene here. The reason that Katie was dropped from Cloud Nine um, because there was. There was a. We didn't even really know that Katie was dropped from Cloud Nine White. The last week when we were talking about this, there wasn't really that much to talk about. She was we just like, no longer on the team. Yeah, in, we I was going to say vague terms, but yeah, no um, terms. Just, yeah, I mean, we we didn't know yeah. whether we kind of assumed that she would be going somewhere else because she was a very good player. Um, but instead, if it feels like um, the the offended party here, Mel, who is not not C9 the, Mel, yeah, not. So not say know. Melanie. <laughs> sure, Melanie, who is a um, an observer um, from uh, Europe? Rainbow Six and oh yeah, from Europe. I think. Is she from Europe? Yeah, I, I think I don't so, know anyway. actually. Um, yeah, and so she felt uncomfortable with the kind of like outpouring of support from Katie after um, after shit had gone down, and so she came out and and said that yeah, basically she had been feeling uncomfortable, so she wanted to kind of explain what had been happening which was essentially like um like a a weird revenge porn kind of situation i mean it's quite it's it's uh, quite what 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 essentially happened is that katie um on an alt account had threatened to uh or, or rather katie on her main had messaged melanie and told her that someone was threatening to release her nudes, which yeah. was also Katie on, on an alternate burner. account. Yeah. Um, and I, she did this to try and have an in to become friends with her. Yeah, it says in this third paragraph here, she threatened to leak my nudes to me because she wanted a reason to reach out to me on her main account. She wanted to be friends to me. And that was, that was something that oh. Melanie kind of realized. I mean, that is like fucked up manipulative behavior that just and then is extremely unusual and wild to hear yeah and then katie ended up admitting it to her that yeah. she was doing it and felt bad and then she went to c9 with the matter and asked as she said initially i went to c9 with the matter asking for it to be handled internally without public shaming um they did but the overwhelming support of the community for someone that has traumatized me still hurts me deeply and so that is why she yeah, then and it, has posted this. And it seems like Melanie's struggling with guilt as well because she feels responsible for, like, fucking Cloud9 white up, you know? Sure. And that's not, that is not, um, it's, it's a very understandable response for somebody in that position, but it's not true. Like, she, she shouldn't feel burdened with the guilt after, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't her that caused this issue. I mean, it she was, was just Katie that existing. Caused this issue. Yeah, and, she was just, just chilling. Just, yeah being herself and then got someone did something 
very manipulative and, this was and just very wrong. A to them. fucked yeah. up situation. I don't even know. Like, it just seems wholly unnecessary. Well, like all around. Like, it's not even <clears> like based off a motive of like some sort of like relationship gone wrong, which still doesn't make it right by any stretch. It's just fucking strange. I mean, it's, it's just strange and it's weird. Strange and also very sad. Um, yeah. I would hope that Katie is seeking out help um, because, uh, yeah, I mean, clearly she, it's, it, she, she, she needs some kind of help uh, mentally or to see a therapist or, or something along those lines. Yeah, because that is um, not and a that is even, thing That is what this. Melanie had said as well. I, she, had even post, she had posted something, a follow-up, as to, like, not crucify Katie, but that, she, you know need to encourage her to seek out help because clearly there's something very wrong if that's what someone feels they need to do to make a friend. Um, yeah, there's yeah, clearly yeah. something, a, a more a deeper insecurity, yeah, a deeper whatnot. Problem. I'm not going to fucking diagnose. I'm not a doctor. Um, but no there's clearly something either. deeper there and yeah. she needs help. Um, so, I mean, just a sad situation all around. Um, and also, you know, sending... Uh, additional love and support to Melanie too. I mean, I'm sure I speak for all of us in saying that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what absolutely. an awful situation to be in. Just where like you have to deal with this, and then people initially, you know, somehow blame like you know you feel so responsible for this happening to like the star women's team in Valorant and probably the premier women's team in esports currently. Honestly, in some respects, it just feels just a shit situation. Yeah. yeah. But again, Melanie's a fault in any really way. good observer too. So like, I'm I'm super happy that she's involved in the scene. I hope that she's she's still gonna be involved. I mean, the the stream she did with Pansy was fantastic. Pansy in Hyde Park, she was observing for that with the, right, with the right. Y, like the replay by Pansy or by whatever. You know, all oh, that fun she stuff. did all of the illustrations for the team logos and stuff I, as well. I think so. Yeah, I, I know so, that yeah. um, Ito she, was also involved, and right, just right. like some really really fun stuff come came out of that stream. So. Yeah. yeah, that was very good. That was very good. Yeah, I mean, needless to say, if you consider doing something like this, don't do something like this. If if this sounds like something that you might do, don't do anything like this. Come on. I feel like it shouldn't even be, need to be said, but just in case anyone I mean, was I don't, thinking it, about getting involved in using people's nudes to manipulate them in any way, fucking don't. I also yeah. want to add that it's called revenge porn and it's illegal. Yeah. Not yeah. beyond everything. It's also you're, illegal. You're literally blackmailing people. <laughs> you, you're you actually extorting them. Also screw the dude that initially like Mel's part or whoever it was that, it, that yeah, started it, this off. To be Fuck clear, it was, it was, it was, it uh, was Melanie's ex-boyfriend of a couple years that had actually leaked these nudes to people yes years which, ago again, that was not it no. wasn't katie doing that initially do to, not to be do clear that. for the store for the clarity of the story mm -hmm. yeah 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 um but yeah i don't know if we want to move on but i, yeah, I do i do just on. want to say as well like to some extent and this is something we were kind of talking about before with other situations but just as to there needs to be i don't know where this assistance comes from i don't know if it comes from the organizations that are paying these players, but there are a lot of young players in esports who have very, who, who, who are coming into esports having played so many video games, either through escapism or other social anxieties, other problems, deep insecurities. We've seen very deep insecurities drive people in gaming to do very yeah. bad things. Yeah. This is. A warped something sense of the norm. This is something that needs to be addressed in in the way of helping these people before they make terrible decisions like this. Yeah, like these people need to be helped before this happens. And I don't know where this help comes from. I mean, I know that organizations are starting to, you know, hiring like sports psychologists, things like that are are more popular in esports now. Yeah. It, it seems, but in more of the traditional therapist sense, perhaps, 
maybe the, maybe there is some need for staffing in that field for some of these younger players. I, I don't yeah. I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, yeah. But right. again, I'm just kind of calling to the effect that there needs to be something done to help some of these people way before we get to this point again. Yeah. Um, yep. And, and I, I talking about it like this helps and specifically bring empathy to both all, all sides of the situation. Right? Don't hate anybody. Um, when th stuff like this happens, just, you know, give support to the people who need it and and move on because that is what's necessary even before, like you're saying, Wyatt. So, yeah, I appreciate that. That's really nice. Yeah, well, from some serious uh, drama here to some idiotic drama, um, because <laughs> we're going to talk about the, the, the ten man Lord. the 10-man debacle that was popping up this weekend. Last week, we were talking about, like, FPL, should some system like that exist in Valorant? Seems like the players just decided to basically make it themselves. And they were like, eh, fuck ranked. We're just going to make a 10-man Discord, which I think uh, Stronglegs started, didn't he? Or, yeah, he or had it for a while before. already. This was a thing that happened before even VCT, right, but okay. nobody played it and it kind of died. And then Tens put the tweet out and all the pros were like, we want FPL. And I, I'm not so, going to say I told you so, but I'm Jesus not up on Christ, this. Someone give fast. me a recap. What the hell is going on here? So like seven, like last week, basically, after the Tens tweet, after our episode and everything, they started to play 10 mans and we started to get like, Legit, really, really good, fun games. Like, rare, very fun to watch. Comms on all sides. Everybody trying. Um, and that happened for two, three days, pretty much. And if anybody wants to go back and watch those, I think they're, they're still really, really fun. But in either case, the the whole management structure was based off of Strong Legs, one of the players, and, and other people were helping him out. And they're trying to establish rules for how people get in. I think the rule was top 25 teams only based off of like actual placements in tournaments. Um, and then there would there'd be like a, a separate section that's tier two and, and stuff like that. So um, basically, I, I, from what I can tell, people were not super happy. People were like, I want to get in. There's a bunch of content creators and, and people who play in VCT who are very, very good and very good at ranked, not being let in. And eventually there's a, there's, I think Mel tweeted like, oh, there's people who are really hating on Roy and DMs, blah, blah, blah. And then Elige from CSGO comes out of nowhere and is like, well, he shouldn't be like a freaking, what is it? Uh, just power abusive. Like he's abusing his power, just like rushing to get the clout from making a 10 man or a Discord server and whatnot. Um, so there's a back and forth. Eventually, I think that Elige is let in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then the server kind of implodes i think they're still like kind of playing but it's not at the level that it was six days ago and we had tens and myth was casting and there was like a lot of hype behind it is that a good synopsis yeah that is a good synopsis i saw that Elige was uh was getting mad on twitter about something and i just assumed it was like yeah you're not going to be in a pro valorant end man because you're not a pro valorant player yeah isn't well, that all a, the, is that not a reasonable All the pro take? Valorant players who are friends with him are like mad because they're like he's the goat. I mean, he is like he he could easily compete in in something like this. And at the same same time, it's like there's no stakes in this. It's not like people's they're playing for VCT or anything like this. So what, what, yeah, so basically everybody's saying chill out, just let people in, relax, and eventually people yeah. that people are in that people don't want to, and now people aren't playing. I think. I think Strong like stepped down to be to just play and not manage it because he didn't want to deal with all this crap and exactly how anybody would have expected. Actually, literally how any of these player run discords have have gone. Yeah, they all go the things. same way. They all go the same way. I was I was in a <laughs> I was in an elite tier pug group in um, in TF2. Had the exact <laughs> same drama in 2012. Some guy left his team and he was no longer on a top team and so he got removed from the group ensue enormous drama people split sides entire discord well it wasn't discord at the time it was mirc but entire <laughs> the, the, IRC. The, old, the old irc channel yep. died the irc no. channel ended up being <laughs> not our irc quiet. yeah <laughs> the zoomers aren't even gonna know about irc you're bringing up no. ancient history yeah, now at this point tech. zoomers won't even know it's like They're you guys are typing text into a channel to play video games? Just imagine like Zoomers that we use Twitch chat to find scrims and bugs. <laughs> <laughs>
You have to sit offline in someone's Twitch chat and just spam the same shit over and over until someone yep. whispers you. That is essentially <laughs> the system that we had. Low mid, looking for scrims. <laughs> <laughs> Exclamation mark, pocket. It's just funny ad. because you know people who are like, I, anybody want to play with me now in Twitch chat? Just like time out, ban. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Us. 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 Well, I don't blame Strong Legs though. I mean, being managing a pro player Discord, especially when you're in a situation where like content creators and people that are pros in other games that sort of want to play, that sounds like hell on earth. Honestly, that just sounds like hell on earth because you're gonna eventually end up in a situation, no matter how well you do it, someone is gonna be salty. And they're gonna make it a fucking disaster for you. I just, I, yeah. I'd rather just pay someone to manage a Discord than have to ever do it myself. Yeah, for that sort uh, of yeah. situation. You're gonna end up with someone with more followers than you calling you cringe on Twitter. That's what's <laughs> yeah, <gonna happen. laughs> a fate none of us want to suffer. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, from the uh, from the attempts at being <laughs> being a pro to the actual pro news of the week. Let's move on to some esports discussion. The first one, the big title headline news, in my opinion, is that the 102 match undefeated streak of Vision Strikers has come to an end. They lost their first ever match as a team in Valorant um, to F4Q, a team with Bunny and Zanba, who are known from Overwatch. Um, it's the team that used to have Doenmo on it as well, but uh, alas, no, no longer. And yeah, they, they ended up getting beaten in an extremely close series. Like both of the maps that they, uh, well, actually, sorry, not both of the maps they lost, but one of the maps they won and also the final map ended up being OT, 16-14. And then they got bodied on split, which is normally their best map. And then on Haven, again, another OT, 15-13. So they were very close to being able to win, but they were also close to just losing 2-0 as well. Um, uh, big times, big times. Yeah, are we are we approaching the the scenario we had previously discussed, where Vision Strikers fall off right before Iceland, and we never get to see them on the international stage? Yeah, it. I mean, it feels like it could happen. Do you want to, Kurt? Can you bring up like where they're at in the? I mean, they still have hope well? because they still have to do. They're still in the elimination matches, right? And they're playing. Yeah. They're playing. I need girlfriend. <laughs> so <laughs> I think Wait, they I need probably girlfriend in the elimination count. match. <laughs> yeah. Uh so um you know Yeah. So so they they're probably <clears> still <throat> going to qualify. They're still the favorites to win the tournament. They've won they've lost their first ever game. But they are looking more shaky recently. Definitely. They are absolutely looking more shaky. This whole series was really weird to me because they like reverted back to the old comps as well. Like they went back to stacks on breach. They went back to King playing Cypher instead of Killjoy, and that and RB on Jet that, as well instead of Raze. They didn't yeah, play exactly. Astro at all in this series either. Which Nothing I found new. It was just literally yeah. old stuff. I mean, maybe the the sets were slightly different. I didn't watch as much back then, but still, like they were doing old flash and dashes yes. and. That's... Really, really high octane executes that were nice to watch for sure, but definitely feels like they didn't bring anything super, super new to the table. Just kind of like refining yeah. the old stuff. Which yeah, and and I think that this kind of makes sense to me. This kind of um, it sh it showcased what is wrong with Vision Striker's old style as well, because mm -hmm. now that the leveling career has improved, it just looks like such a flaw when you see them play this 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 um, style with the the pure flash and dash just execing onto sites because they don't take any map control they don't work the map at all they don't go quiet and try and bait out info plays from defenders they literally just try and like in this example they try and take a uh, long control and then they hit the site and there's no there's no pump fake there's no trying to bait out defensive utility early on particularly they're just taking map control and then executing into the site and that happened over and over again in the series and it just became extraordinarily readable. On top of that, the Astra utility was really good from Zunba. I'm seeing mm -hmm. a lot of people say he's like the best Astra in the world or whatever. The Astra gameplay in Europe has also been really high level, so I wouldn't go that far. But he's definitely like, he was having a huge impact in this match. Um, and they had some really nice ideas of what they wanted to do with it. Um, I think the, it, it seems to suit them. The Zunba uh, bunny synergies were absolutely insane i mean we all yeah, talked yeah. about raise synergies with astra already but like every time i saw nade go out with a gravity well it was catching one every single time and i think 
part of that was Vision Strikers not respecting the Astro utility at all. Yeah, yeah. Which which feels weird. They were just like executing through uh, because they had RB who can dash just over top, anyways. But it just it, it literally every time there was a nade and a gravity well used, it was in the perfect moment in the perfect spot catching somebody. It was amazing. Yeah, it did feel like their strategy was Astro utility is annoying to deal with, so we're gonna flash and dash past it, and we're just gonna <laughs> wait for RB to kill everybody. But that doesn't work because Arby's the only guy that can get through and he can't kill everybody with the flash and dashes. <laughs> That's not going to open up a site for you. Um, you need more than just one person in the site. So it ended up looking like a very poor series for Vision Strikers. I think they came into it with the wrong plan and it was a bit of an off day for them. But it doesn't, it doesn't make me feel... It doesn't make me feel like they're definitely not making it to Iceland, you know? They're still the favorites in Korea. They, this is still the first match they've ever lost, and it was double OT or whatever on Haven. You could argue yeah, they they're didn't lucky look to be able to make it They just it looked like Haven. they had the wrong read, you know? They just had the wrong read. Like, it wasn't like... Like, they didn't... They weren't playing poorly, like, as individuals. They didn't have, like, a terrible performance during the series either. It just... Yeah. They just looked, like, ancient. They just looked like some old... You know, some Jurassic Park looking shit where they brought them back to life and they're still playing a meta that's 300,000 years old because yeah. they have, there's no Astro, there's not even Viper. And this is 2.06. So this is like what Viper is very, Wait, very strong. Wait, was this 2.06? Yes. I didn't yes. know that, actually. Yes. yes. I didn't know. This is 2.06. That 2. is weird 6. then. Uh, why? Yeah, that is weird. I, 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 I think Glow had a terrible series though as well. When yes. you were talking about like individual performance, I think. But he's also the IGL. So that's why I think maybe those two things might be linked. Like they had a bad read mm -hmm. on the game. I, the IGL plays really poorly. I think the Almost two are probably linked together. Agreed. I think that's always the case. Why are you going to say something? I, yeah, I mean, I just, I think I, I, I find the, the, you know, they, they, they won the, the last stage in, in narrow fashion and not in impressive fashion either. Um, and that was off them trying something new with Arby playing a lot of the Rays and, and Stax playing Sky. Um, King had been on Killjoy for quite a while. But they were trying a, a bit of a different look, and it was fine. They were still ahead of the competition, but it wasn't anything remarkable. And I wonder if, due to the fact that they did narrowly win, that inspired them to think, Okay, let's just go back to what we were dominating everybody with. But I find that to be a very worrying decision. I don't yeah. like when teams try to solve the problems by just going back in time. It's like when TSM were like, okay, well, Drone will play Phoenix and we'll just go back to what was working back that one era around first strike or so. So Rosa will play Smokes and we'll just we'll go do that thing again. And... <laughs> Didn't work. And then they have to change 70 times again. And I but, feel like it's a sort of... I feel like that is a pattern I've seen many times before. And it never ends with the team flourishing. But, but here's why I'm not worried about that particularly. is okay. because they only did it for this match. The previous yes. matches that they played to get to this position, they were still playing RB on Rays the whole time. They were still playing some different comps. It's just that this one they decided... Ah, fuck it. Let's go back. So oh, okay. I think this is probably like a read based on scrims against them, uh, against F4Q. Because F4Q okay. is the best team that they've played on this like run towards um, making it to Iceland. Which was, I mean, it's still the wrong read, but I don't know whether it's going to be something that they... It's not they're, like they're a pattern at this point. not permanently doing it. Yeah. I, I honestly think that this speaks to the level of career, how, how, how much it's risen since the old days of Vision sure. Striker. Yeah. Uh, because... They ran their style, and it's not, it's not even like they, they fixed the, like, F4Q was running um, stuff that fixed the problems that we were all diagnosing in Korea, which is like, you just, everybody lets Vision Strikers have way too much space. They let them get up to execute points, and they just execute, right? That was like a symptom of yeah. Korea in general, and F4Q still let that happen. They still let them walk up to Hookah and walk up to Long and just execute. They were just ready they were ready to fight yeah. them they were ready yeah, to outplay ready. them and they knew the executes they knew the counters while they happened which to me wasn't really happening before so i, yeah. I do think that this speaks to f4q's level as well um for that aspect but also on their own end like they were doing some crazy shit as well i mean bunny this guy is a 
a monster. Yeah. He just dives in with with a judge looking like tens and kills everybody. Um, we already talked about Zumba, but 5K, this man he had, a, had game. a life game on Haven. Yeah. Like, ridiculous. 30-something kills. Like, yeah. 35 kills. Unbelievable. Yeah, he did super well. I think um, when I think about, like, our, our vision strike is going to make it to Iceland... I don't know who would stop them yet. I don't know whether FOQ is going to continuously be able to bring the level to be able to stop them. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's it's definitely plausible. But that we we've said for a long time actually when we've been discussing Vision Strikers back since like the first strike and before that for, Vision Strikers are not going to be probably the team that um, that stays at the top in Korea forever. They have a lot of old talent on the team. They have a really interesting method of playing. But at the end. Normally what happens in these regions is that eventually the talent in the rest of the scene gets good enough that you have some cracked out kids that learn how to play by playing against Vision Strikers and end up superseding them. And they're the team that becomes like really good in the region. Um, I don't think that's happened yet in Korea. I don't think that there's like, I don't think FOQ are the successors, if you want to put it like sure. that. They might be, they might become that, but I don't think they're there yet. I still think New Turn is probably their biggest challenge, their biggest threat. I think that they play a more solidly solid game than anybody else in Korea outside of Vision Strikers. To me, to me, this is like a battle between FaZe and Sentinels in NA. Like I can liken it to that, just the way that um, F4Q is playing, the way that they bunny in 5K, the double duelist type of thing. Just kind of, it, it did feel at certain points, especially on that bind map, um, that they were just schmeeging their way onto site, and Vision Strikers had no, nothing prepared against how to hold it. Um, yeah. So it it feels like that, and maybe the same thing will happen where we're sent or where vision strikers in this case will figure it out for the next time they they play. But I do see F4Q giving a lot of teams problems, which is interesting because I always thought that this team was trash. Yeah, they, yeah, they've definitely improved. Absolutely, it's been a big level up in the game. Um, let's move over to the North American scene because there was some big, uh, big changes actually happening in Cloud Nine in the Cloud Nine camp. Mm. And it's got to the point now where we were talking about the old Cloud9 roster after 10's left, and we're like, well, this team is all over the place. That roster barely exists anymore. It's about to not exist. I yeah. mean, poor Mitch has to live on another six-man roster knowing that his days are leading the team, trying to do his best for Iceland, knowing his days are numbered. Seems likely, I mean, it? it's yeah. That sucks. It does suck. But here we go with another Cloud9 six-man roster era. But... Yeah, I mean, everybody, I mean, yeah, well, sorry, Mitch, but just, uh, well, what, what are you going to do? Yeah, <laughs> let's talk about you Relics just... first, though, right? Because he was the guy that's actually left recently. Yeah. But as far as where, he, from what his statement, he didn't say that he was pushed out the team or whatever. He just said he didn't really believe in the direction of the roster anymore, and it wasn't what he signed on to play with. He signed up to play with that original roster with Tens, yeah. Shinobi, Mitch, and Vice. And now Tens left. Oh, well, Shinobi kicked. Ends left, Vice kicked, Relics has decided, well, this isn't the team that I wanted to play with anymore. I'm out. Now, I don't know whether he was also pushed out the door a little bit because it seems like that with how many extra pieces Cloud9 are adding, but I I'm going to take him at his word that he was just decided it was time to leave. Yeah, he, he referenced some yeah burnout and mental health and that uh, as being some reasons for wanting to step down for now as well. Um, I mean, I'm so. sure the situation has it would make any player pretty pretty tired you know after dealing yeah. with all the roster shuffles and the performance and just having to deal with all the uncertainty surrounding it it's like a pretty draining experience as a player to have to deal with so much roster uncertainty yeah for sure um it's, it's interesting though because to me this speaks to a state of the scene and how how often teams are getting put into this situation where there are people who are Clearly, like, what the hell is going on? I don't know who I'm going to play with the next day. It speaks to getting to that, you know, franchise type place where where players just have to deal with the the way that this runs. It's not CS where your roster will be your roster. There are going to be transactions being made, and I think that players, especially those who really haven't dealt with that at a at like the biggest biggest of pro levels, um, have to adapt to it. Oh, right. that's actually, you just brought up an interesting point as well that we forgot to mention during the Fraud interview. When Fraud was talking to Richard Lewis, he was talking about, um, he was talking about the, all of the teams that are currently in the scene yeah. um, are looking uh, as if 
they they they're all ready to be franchised. Like mm. he was at, he was saying, it's like Riot's t- already talking to these teams, saying if you want a franchise spot in the future, when if we make that system, you have to be playing ball today. Is the words that he, as in, you need to be ready. You need to have a plan to be able to finance something like that. You need to be kind of invested in the scene and in the grassroots level, so that we know what you guys are like as a as team owners, as team organizations. Okay. Um, so that's that's a very interesting little additional yeah. piece of info there from somebody who might have been in in tangentially uh, in some of these in some of these business discussions or whatever. But uh, yeah, anyway, mm. sorry. Talk about Clyde Nine. Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay. After we open that Pandora's box, let's, uh, uh, let's talk about Cloud Nine. Yeah, I mean that being said, though, this new Cloud Nine roster that they're putting together, which is it's just chaos from CS. Um, yeah, they. I mean, they've slurped the roster over to the the, the Valorant side. Uh, I mean, there was. I, I know in CS:GO as well when Cloud9 were trying to find a new team, people wanted them to just get chaos. Uh, the team that Steel was previously on, previously on, etc. They had gotten dropped. Well, they got them, but Valorant. they're playing Valorant instead now. Well, it's, uh, it was Floppy wasn't on chaos, was he? I think no. It was Floppy was on the C9 no, I, actual you, CS:GO. Cloud9 was on the actual CS:GO roster, yeah. but Leaf no, and Zeppa. No, I know, Zeppa. I know. Both both Floppy and Zeppa come from that actual C9 CS:GO roster, but yeah, I don't think Floppy was on chaos. I think it was no Zeppa, Zeppa and only. Leaf. Yeah, yeah. Zepp and Lee for, um, and I mean these are these are three guys who were uh, solid upcoming players in CS, all young guys. Um, you know they they they've swapped at the right time, probably for for their own careers in in the sense that uh, they're still young with a lot of potential. They haven't been fully molded over by the years of CS. They've just got the raw talent. Um, I don't know what I haven't watched any of them play Valorant. Zeppa evidently hasn't even played much Valorant. He seemed really excited to join the team. Do you want to pull tweet, Kurt? You should pull up the tweet of Zeppa announcing that he's joining. He's so excited to play Valorant. Really? Yep, he's yeah. he's just I don't know frothing why I just at the mouth a bunch to get on the starting emojis, roster. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of funny. But... I mean, a lot of these guys would have preferred to stay in CS. I think had it been alive, I think. No, Pog it, champ. It is Pog not. Champ, no, Pog it, that's champ. about Floppy being announced. There's one about his announcement. Um, but <laughs> I'm still excited about Floppy. When does the yeah, very excited for Floppy. The public space. I want to see one of the players just put Borpa spin, Borpa spin <laughs> upon announcement. But I mean, is this an Overwatch meme? I don't get it. <laughs> it's just. It's I, just I don't a, know where it came from. I just, just found the email, email and it's, but, it's really good. Okay. I'm, I. I like the direction that Cloud Nine's going in, though. I think yeah, the, I too. the very beginning of Cloud Nine, I always uh, oh yeah, just so just not yeah. excited. <laughs> it sucks Ooh. to think I never reach my because I was looking CS. for something exciting and I saw this. And I'm like, hmm. oh yeah, that's what yeah, that's what I was getting at. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was yeah. But I that, was being sarcastic. But He's just Zeppa has been Zeppa has been added to this team as a developmental player of the future, right? He's actually not planning on being playing. No, he's currently. not playing immediately. Yeah, which and that's is why Mitch is just have fun, in, Mitch. Yeah, in limbo right now. <laughs> yeah. But so aren't, aren't all these C9 CS guys signed to three year three? Weren't they signed to three year contracts? Pretty long contracts I'm, as I'm part of sure. like what do they call it? The Goliath Project or whatever? Colossus. 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 That's what it was. The that's Colossus. The Valorant so. the Goliath. Yeah. I, mean, I, find, I find it odd that they've essentially moved from like one floppy, is, at least, has moved from like one roster disaster to another roster disaster within the same organization. <laughs> like, right, right. Because it's, it's the same organization, they, they don't have to mess with the, the contract yeah. length. They can just renegotiate with, you know, with themselves for, for whatever the, the new contract system. I, I, yeah, I mean, when I look at that tweet from Zeppa and stuff, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it is sad. NACS has died, and some of these guys' hands have just been forced to move yeah. over to Valorant. That's not what I want. I don't want people that are forced to play Valorant. I want people that want to play Valorant. So, I, I don't know, man. Like, maybe, maybe that's not going to work out. Maybe Mitch stays on the team full-time. But I think this Cloud9 reshuffle was always needed. The, the rebuilding of this team, the writing was on the wall for months, like, for so long now. And they've actually slowly ship a Theseus it and have uh, just replaced one piece at a time until it's a very new different better 
roster, I think. It has more potential now with with Poise, yeah. with Leaf, uh, with um, with Zeta, um, and, and now with I mean, we'll just Floppy. have to see how the new players perform, right? Because I like where the roster was at when we saw them earlier, like the, the potential there, but we haven't seen how Floppy is necessarily going to slot into this, right? We don't know how flo what Floppy's role is going to be, and obviously whatever is going to happen with Zeppa. So... Yeah, I mean, presumably, don't really know yet. if they try to keep the same thing, Floppy will play Smokes. Yeah. Because um, I'm just afraid but, it could turn into yeah. like a T1 situation where yeah, like CS it's God this mess of roles smokes. and a disaster of players like trying to figure it out, like whatever. Like obviously it's a long-term commitment and it's a long-term commitment, but that's just my worry is like I sort of liked where they were going. I, would, I almost would have preferred C9 to maybe just find more endemic Valorant players versus just getting players from cs again that are sort of being forced to move over so you know we'll see yeah depends on their motivation I yeah suppose. i think this roster this roster definitely has potential though i mean even just if you look at the core of what they have already yeah. what we were talking about we, last time with, with boys and uh boys leaf, leaf zeta as well on support it's yeah. a good core. I mean, they, they definitely, with those three, they have something to build around. And Mitch being their in-game leader and all that, you know, fine. And I, I, do, I do genuinely, I do feel kind of bad for him. I mean, it is a... a it's it's a, the it's last a, one left. Yeah, it's just the last one left. And that, that's kind of what I was saying, though. The situation has, has changed for, for esports, especially CS players. Like... Teams are going to make changes. You got to you got to deal with that and potentially like put yourself in a good position to be traded or sold to another team as well. Like yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about another shift that's happened within the NA scene. Player one leaves version one as well. Um, I didn't follow this news. I don't know what's been happening with them. I just know that version one actually did pretty damn well recently, and they've they've qualified for the next step in terms of this road to Iceland. So it seems like a strange time to me to be making. What is a, a relatively significant move within the team? Yeah, I, I was struggling to find what the reason for this was. Player One didn't really give you exact terms as to why he's no longer on the team either. Um, and it obviously, yeah, it comes at a strange time. They had the best result they've had yet qualifying for the Challenger Final. They were looking pretty good. I... It's much like when player one was kicked from Gen G. I don't think he was the problem. <laughs> He's still a good player. He's kind of always just been a solid player. Um, I don't know. Did you, did you have some more info on this Bala? You were saying I, earlier I think from, he's, he's got another from, project or something? Well, from what I could tell, I was just trying to look it up a little bit before the episode as well. I, I saw some random rumor that there was another team being formed with, with like, I don't know. I don't think it's credible. But But from his Twitter... What is credible from him, obviously, he says that this is like personal reasons. And he also says he's not practicing for it. Like he says, it feels weird not to be practicing for any VCT, but obviously it's kind of downtime right now anyways. But he did say this is personal reasons. So maybe this is not to do with like them trying to improve at all. Maybe it's just player one having to deal with something else in his life. Yeah, rough situation though for a, t for a team that's going into the Challengers finals as significant underdogs. Because even though they qualified in, what, fourth seed, yeah. they are going to look like probably the eighth seed coming into Challengers Finals. So mm -hmm. now with a player change as well, it's, that is rough. If you're trying to be the plucky underdog team that's got some upset potential, you want to lean into at least the fact that you understand your teammates and you know what you're doing together and you have a good plan and you have more time yep. to practice while everyone else is qualifying. All of that shit just flies out the window now. Yeah. <laughs> Evidently, they're, they're playing with Whippy. Who I can't remember what team he was on. Ghost. Uh, oh, yeah. Ghost. Ghost. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, I heard that they'll be playing with him. I don't know that guy. Was, did he look decent? Anyone? I haven't uh, seen I enough to have a strong. No? I haven't watched enough, any yeah. Ghost. Not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, I've never watched Ghost. Really. I, I do. Right. I, I looked up his stats. He just, he plays Omen for the most part. So not even yeah. like player one's role or anything like that. Huh. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, let's move on, though, to the teams who are going to be contesting version one when it gets to the Challengers finals. North mm -hmm. America's lagging behind some of the other regions a little bit. It feels weird that every time we do these episodes, they're like halfway through a Challenger. So we don't get to recap the, the, the full thing. It's just so far. 
Um, where is the bracket even up to right now? It's so round the, of 16 or something. No, the round of 16 is, yeah. Probably yeah. Just finished. It's round of eight, right? Yeah, so it's we're, the, we're yeah. about to start the main event. So we're about yeah. to start the whole double elim bracket thing. Yep. Right. Sorry, I, I've completely, yeah, I've missed track of that. Yes. So the challenges, so challenges two has finished. Challenges finals. No. No. Challenges, challenges two, two is happening. Qualifiers has finished. Yeah, the open challenges qualifiers Challenges two finished. main event is here. Yes. yes. And this is the main yeah. event bracket. Mmm. So juicy. <laughs> What, what, what do we got? <laughs> this might be the worst <laughs> NA bracket you're, you're I've seen so in a sarcastic. long time. Wyatt, what, what dude? dude, but it's, I'm just so, de like, I, I'm so demotivated right now with this bracket. It just it I mean, feels like, like it, the worst we've had in a while. Like, C9, we at least get to see the new C9 blue roster. Yeah, you know? that's exciting. That's I'm excited something. for that match. Like individually, I, I'm I'm pretty hype about everything just because we get to see more Valorant. And we're getting so freaking close to, well, to Reykjavik, but some of these matches, some of these teams here, <laughs> it doesn't feel like the same level as Challengers Three was last yeah. time. Well, or well any of the challenges previously. Let's go over maybe some of the reasons for that. Right, we were talking about this being a really competitive bracket actually because there were so many upsets in the previous one. Sentinels got upset, FaZe got upset, Gen G got upset. That's the top three teams. Only one yep. of those yep. has made it through and to this bracket. Where are they? You're right. So let's start I mean, there. Sentinels made it through. They had a pretty easy run of the bracket by all accounts. Yeah. FaZe and Gen G. I mean, let's start with FaZe. I mean, FaZe losing to T1. One. Right. One. Pretty wild. Now, there was definitely a, a bit of a stylistic perhaps advantage to T1 in that in, in the, the very general sense of them being a slow team on a lot of the rounds and, and yeah. FaZe were just kind of walking into them. That was definitely the case on Icebox, uh, which but was the But they clapped them on Icebox series. last time. They played them at Masters 1 like to qualify and they Who, boomed them. FaZe? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, but this is not the same FaZe that we're witnessing. Right. I mean, this is... It does seem like after getting wrecked by... I mean, FaZe had rolled every team in the scene and then gotten rolled themselves by Sentinels twice. And since then, they have been swapping around roles. It seems that they've just been trying to, some extent, reinvent themselves so they can be the number one team rather than just improving on what they had already... what they already had going for them with the aggressive style and uh, with the comps that they were running and trying to find a way to beat Sentinels within that. And, and also, they were a solid number two in the scene while they were doing that at the time. They were the second best team at the for time. For that one tournament. For that yeah. tournament. Yeah. Um, and now they've dropped off significantly. I mean, on this map in particular, they were just kind of haphazardly aggressing on defense for the first half. And the T1 players were just sat in spawn, getting the kills and trading them out, always with advantages on the trading. Players just kind of walking up A main. It, it wasn't as there, there, there wasn't as much coordination, and there wasn't as much uh, decisive swinging from Phase. I'll say that. Like on their retakes as well. When Phase were on their run, all of the retakes were really fast. All the players were in supporting each other. There was a decisive call made. Everyone acted on it. Everyone was trading. In these games, the retakes, pretty slow. Not really trying to catch any players out, uh, but by doing a fast timing while the spike is going down. They just... They, it, it feels like they, they lost that extra... that extra gear that they went into. They've just... They're just okay. They're playing okay. Yeah. And in some cases, really sloppy. I mean, in this game, they struggled they lost against some... the Viper in particular. I felt on this map, honestly, a lot of the yeah. reasons they weren't playing like Sky or anything to flash through. Like they had no flashes outside of the Omen to deal with the Viper on Icebox. And Curry literally just split the site so often. And they actually had, especially on the retakes here for their offense, where like Phase was looking to retake like on 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 A site, and they had no, they just had no answer to this like ever for the most part like watch so, like the, obviously this is a viper ult so like i'm not gonna really put too much stock in this clip that's happening in front of us but if we see like further clips they're on like if you watch the match like they just couldn't get through the walls a lot of the time and they just had a free like sight hits and free side holds for the retakes because they had no flashes during this map for the viper and it's weird because this is also patch 2.06 and a lot of these na teams including phase were not playing viper at all I mean, also, you have to be ready to counter Wait, Viper when T1 are running it. This is patch 2.06. They yes. were playing on 2.06? Yes. Yes. I didn't yep. even realize. And there's no Viper. And there's no Viper. 
It's I mean, it was very here, strange. Right? Yeah. There was I'm, here for T1, which is part of why FaZe, I think, struggled a lot on Icebox. Like, on top of all the things Wyatt mentioned, I just think they struggled to deal with the Viper utility. So, I I, I kind of disagree with, well, not not necessarily with you, Avas, but the fact that this is, like, the old, like, this is not what we saw, not the level of FaZe that we saw at Challengers 3 and Masters. In my mind, I actually think that they were doing the same stuff. Um, but... T1 was punishing them. I mean, Skadoodle, especially in this map, was absolutely shitting on Corey. Like, any time he tried to do the boom bot, like, aggro, he was just getting destroyed. Whenever he got up close to gate, like, it, like up ahead there, Spider was also doing very well against him. He was just getting shut down. And that was a big aspect to how FaZe was very good on Icebox specifically. Uh, uh, and also... This map, they're not really doing anything new comp-wise. They're not, they're not reinventing themselves. This is literally what they played on Icebox. And this is the map that they were really, really, really getting praised on because of the yeah, stuff yeah. that they were doing, right? So I think there's a combination of two things here. Um, they played T1 before, and T1 play, ran this basic comp, except they had Skadula on Raze instead of Sky. And what Avast is saying about 2.06 and Viper, I think, applies. But they did lose when they were playing Viper last time around. Yeah. That's so true. this is two things. T1 came with new stuff. It wasn't like they ran the same stuff that they were running in last time against FaZe. They actually had looks with Viper on the A site, which they didn't have in their Challengers 3 run. They were using the wall dynamically and not necessarily putting it down on B every single time like we've seen in NA happen over and over. Um, so I think all that new stuff really came out, Skadoodle on Sky being one of those as well. Um, and then the Viper patch just completely buffs this this way of playing for t1 obviously but phase was not respecting the decay at all and when they they when they weren't respecting it there was not even like an idea of how to counter like marv just runs through by himself not too peaking at all which is how you actually play against it and is not struggling against viper in general except for when teams do stuff like this in general the viper stuff is not even like people aren't really thinking about it. People aren't playing yeah. Viper because they actually think she's kind of weak from what I can tell. Like there's only a few teams who are running Viper, even in the opens, um, just because the coordination can get you through. So it's those two aspects in my mind. And I, I don't think that, except on the other maps, I think phase all the stuff that you said, why it is, is true about them, like trying to reinvent themselves and not really working out. Yeah, that's... Um, Kind of that's kind of more what I was getting at, just in, in the general sense, not not specific to Icebox or that comp, because that one was the same one. I think they, I, I agree with the Viper thing as well. I, I do think they lost out though as well, just from uh, their mm -hmm. their aggression was not working and it was not as coordinated as it was during their run. But I, I think what would, one of the strange things with this series too was how the map picks and bans went. They let split yes. go through, yeah. but they oh, banned Haven. They banned Haven. Haven was one of the maps where they were trying to reinvent themselves, where they were running the Cory Breach and different things, and they banned that. They had played T1 on it previously, and it was a close game, but I, I don't know. Suddenly, FaZe don't want to play Haven, but they wanted to play Split. I found that strange. And then on Bind, they were, <laughs> on Bind FaZe definitely did reinvent themselves, and it looked good, but it was hard to tell because T1 ran the same round yep. 12 rounds in a row on defense. And that is not an exaggeration. It's unbelievable. They ran the exact same setup. Kurt, you could bring up any round from the first half so I could and just play <laughs> from the beginning. It, you will have watched every round in the half. It's unbelievable. They yep. put, they, every single round, Curry was playing Viper. He would put the wall down in shower and he would molly at the door. Uh, where the orb is on defense yeah. at the beginning of every single round. And every single round, Marved and uh, Raucous, the recon would just go through into showers. T1 never actually played in showers, a single round. They just put the wall and the one molly. And FaZe would retake showers immediately, every single time, execute on A with full shower control. T1 played super passive backsight and won every, and FaZe won every single round. It was... Yep. It was a ridiculously silly game. Uh, I mean, FaZe had some cool rounds, though, and some cool ideas. On this one, Zachary was playing the Astra. There was one round where they... It was so cool, actually. They expected... It's right here. Yeah, they right expected here, right here. the shower crunch coming in, so Zachary mm -hmm. put a gravity well in the TP, and they just boomed the that T1 shower really good, crunch. Actually. It was such a cool round. They were doing other things like Baby was buying the Odin and they would put a gravity in lamps um, and you would try to spray someone through the wall yeah, that got yeah. caught in it. They had a lot of cool ideas, but also how good would they have done against a team that did 
I don't know one other thing. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it felt was like it was astounding. I, I mean, T one felt like they they looked on Icebox the first time they brought that Viper out, where it's like they are just putting the wall down on B literally yeah. every single time, and they had no depth. It felt like they were trying to just run the Viper Astra and and just bring it to the table without it necessarily being ready for for a team like Face. That Odin stuff. And though, it was strange for Baby Bay was because they did dynamic Viper walls before that, right, Ball? Like they yep. literally, that's what's so strange about this is that they did dynamic Viper walls before this on Icebox. And then on Bind, they just didn't. They just it's, didn't move the wall any time. It's weird too, because like Bind, there's so much to study, like in terms yeah. of Viper play. Like just go watch EU yeah, and all yeah, of a sudden you is. have 15 different walls. And the funny part too is we were talking about the 10 mans and pugs. Like I was watching the VODs of that uh, and Curry played Viper on Bind with those and literally did this exact setup <laughs> every <laughs> single round, dude. Yeah. yeah just, and he yeah, fit on the other, the other eternal team, player. but I mean, still. I, um, yeah, well, when I was watching FaZe during their Masters 1 run, though, I did get the, I got the impression pretty heavily that it was a honeymoon period for them, that they had figured out something that worked really well for them. They were slapping teams around by, this is a different round, by the way, in case you were wondering, this is a literally different round. That yes, right yes, now. it is. Um, and uh, yeah, and the, the, a lot of their style was around catching teams off guard and hitting their shots better than everybody else was. Do you feel like they're going to actually be able to get back to where they were, where they were clearly the second best team during Masters 1? The I, second best team? Yeah. No. I mean, I, I don't think we would have even said that they would be that while they were on that run. No, I mean, that's why, yeah, that's why I'm I, kind I mean, of getting that. Was that. I thought it was a honeymoon a hun period. It was definitely a honeymoon period, but I didn't foresee them falling off this hard. This hard. Right, I mean, right. this is pretty significant. I mean, genuinely, though, I do think if they had let Haven go through and Band split, they probably would have made it through, unless T1 are also... T1, to me, look right now like if th they, they are 100% reliant on preparation. They clearly cannot... This map is evidence that they do not have the ability to adapt. Right, um, yeah. They made no significant change, like... Spider was playing Phoenix. He was in hookah every single round. He played over at A maybe once or twice. They never played aggressively off the wall trying to do some kind of flash peek through it to counter the players, pushing in a shower. Just no, no adaptation. But on split, T1 looked really good. They had a lot of really cool ideas. Days was playing Sage. They had a unique uh, idea on, on several of the rounds where they would place his wall. Like they would take uh, part of A heaven and then like wall off half of heaven and then like try to fake through ropes and then they would, they would either double back to A or they would, you know, put all that A pressure on and then they would swift hit B. Spider would already be lurking in the B heaven. They had a lot of really cool ideas on split and it paid off and they won the map. A lot of really they cool ideas on Icebox too. and they won the map. But it, it seemed 100% dependent on their preparation. Um, I, I think if Haven had gone through, FaZe might have made it through. But again, it would be so close that you still aren't it's feeling still worrying. Yeah, you're still not feeling confident about phase. This has always kind of been the, especially in open qualifiers. Like, I mean, last week as well, they, they, I forgot who they lost to in the, the round of 16 or whatever it was to qualify, but they almost lost the team Basilisk. It was yeah. a 2 1. Yeah. Like, they have always randomly struggled against teams who shouldn't be on their level. I, I think that's been a, a thing that people have said a lot about phase. And I, I think I, we're still seeing that. It feels like they oftentimes play to the level of of, of other teams. Um, and yeah, I, I also think that the playbook that we talked about, like, oh, Sentinels beat them. Everybody can just go watch the Sentinels game and, and, and work it out. But I, I do think that teams are implementing that. Just just don't be scared of Corey and Baby Bay. Like, bring it to them. And they won't know how to... They they won't know how to fi like figure it out and get get to a spot where they need to go. Like that has in my mind been a gap, and I think Sentinels abused it. I think any team that's playing against them right now is abusing it. I think T1 on Icebox and Split significantly abused that fact. To just get in their face, do something unexpected, and Phase won't have a, a response. Also, yeah, you mentioned I, it earlier, Bala, but they're playing double smokes on Split mm -hmm. here as well. Double this is, controller, this is cool. Which was something yeah. that in the past has been not nearly as good but they actually made it work here pretty well like they had like some pretty good setups with how they took control of the map and like all of their generally all of their combos with the astra or also or even with like the sage and how they took map control were pretty cool 
mm -hmm. with the using the double controller. Yeah. They did, I mean, they did it on Bind too with After yeah. Viper, but I, sure. I put that in a category of its own, right? It's sure. Like yeah. After yeah, Viper yeah. is the is the is the juice right now. This is yeah. different. This Astra Omen, like who the who, who, like yeah. they were who they the were running this, I think, in two point oh five as well. Yeah, and it wasn't good when they, they did it in two point oh five. It really right. wasn't good when they tried yeah. to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk I, about Gen G then, because they were the third team from Masters, and they also failed to make it through in a surprising. I mean, they got dial back of the clock. They got yeah. I mean, they got blown up by TSM in what looked like Nerd Street Gamers decided to live stream a VOD from the Phase Invitational. I mean, it was just... <laughs> have Genji ever beaten TSM? Is that... Yes. They have. Challenges yeah. to, uh, but to qualify. Right. That was the team that, back then, they could... They didn't... I don't think they actually beat TSM once in all of 2020, but they beat them in 2020. Right, one. okay. Um, but, yeah, I mean, what can you say? Wardell was like 21 and 2 at one point. Yeah, he sense, literally just pooped on them on a synth. But, and it was like you said, it was like he was just opping and killing everybody. But, That's, but was like, is that Waddell what being a freak or is that Gen G just not respecting him, not playing around him? Both. Yeah, both. It was definitely both. And on Haven, it was, I think it was more of Gen G's fault actually on Haven. I think that the comp that they ran was. They didn't run a utility heavy comp. Phoenix is not good at flashing jets off angles. Wardell was kind of just holding angles with impunity at all times on this Haven map. And then also when G on Genji's attack, they played very slow rounds walking around the map, trying to take a little bit of map control more so with presence than utility. And when they actually, when it came time to execute, there were a lot of executes where GMD would have like one smoke. And Wardell's just, okay, I'm just standing here. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? And they would just kill one every time. Um, they, they never, they, on their attack side, they never switched up what they were attempting to do. And what they needed to do was mix in a few rounds where they were just going to, okay, we're just going to hit a site and dump all of our utility and have it on every single angle. And we are not going to get opt going in. But they never really tried that. They just played a lot of slow rounds and Wardell just picked them apart slowly. Um, so I, I was pretty disappointed in, in the performance I saw from Gen.G on Haven. On this map, I don't know. What, I, to some extent, it's like, what can you do when he's having the best game he's had of 2021? One of the better, one of the best games he's ever had? I don't know. Is there an answer when a guy literally can't miss? Yeah, I mean, he, he, Waddell's always been extremely good, even when TSM was slumping, too. I feel like, all right, like he doesn't, he doesn't take over games for them all the time, but you can still tell that he's a top, top Jet player, even though he's on a team that's been slumping like a motherfucker recently. Yeah, Jinji also did some, for, for Synth on top of the word L popping off, Jinji also were like really, they kind of were just like focused on Tree the entire map. Like they just looked at Tree and taking Tree control on both offense and defense a lot of the times, especially their offense, and they just lost. Like, all the time on tree, they never hit other parts of the, the, the map ever a lot of times. And because they were doing this, Wardell would just, like, own the extremities of the map and, like, get a pick. And then they would, like, rotate the tree to get another pick. Like, it was... Jinji looked so much worse than they had recently on this in this match for some reason. It's like they just forgot and everything else they've been doing and just, like, fell back on old habits, which I kind of think is, like, a trend in general for looking at some of this matches from the open qualifier no experimentation no no yeah. astra nothing new at all from genji and it felt like they couldn't even do some of the old stuff there was never any control on any extremities and just quite honestly th this is how tsm wins you just cannot let wardell and Sabrosa gain any momentum if they gain momentum you're done for and genji is a team that really struggles to get out of those holes um, and that was evident. I mean, how many rounds in a row did some of these these uh, halves go? It's like ridiculous. Mordell yeah. and, and Sabrosa just fragged out of their minds and nothing could stop them. And I think that that is scary for teams. But as soon as they run into some adversity, I, I still don't think I'm still not convinced that this is like a, a great win for anything from TSM. I honestly thought that they were going to throw the ascent game because Wardell started <laughs> sleeping a little bit on the second half. I honestly right. did. 
<laughs> because yeah. uh, Gen G won a couple in a row. I was like, oh, I'm starting to scratch. Like, they're still, they weren't playing, they weren't doing anything crazy. There's, they're just like, not even any team play, really. It was just Wardell fragging out. Yeah. That, that was mean, essentially it. At one point, three of the Gen G players were 0 and 7. Like, yeah, you know, that's kind of brutal. The first, the first three rounds were all flawlesses for TSM. And that's when, and Wardell was like 10 and 2, while yeah. three players were 0 and 7. Yeah, it the first the first disgusting. three rounds was 4K, 3K, 3K. Yeah. He died the next, and then it was another 4K. Like, uh, yeah, that's that, that's pretty mental. That he just took over the game, and you can't, you can't. Well, let's just can't. let's take a look at the bracket as well, and and see how we feel about it. Because it seems like with TSM and T1 winning, you guys, uh, even though they beat some serious opposition that did extremely well at Masters One. I'm not getting the impression that you guys are true believers just yet. It's not like these are the new great teams, TSM and T1. It's just, <laughs> well, yeah, it was pretty we say poor that. performances from the others. We and say have... that, but then I look at the bracket and I'm like, oh, holy shit, maybe I have a believer. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I mean, I, I have a little, I, I have more faith in T1 than I do in TSM. I mean, I think T1 are at least on the maps that they're good on, they're approaching them with interesting ideas that they've, they've clearly been working on right um so i think there's there could be something there but i i, I want to i want to agree with you but this is literally for tsm's their their last chance like this is their last chance and i think that that is actually good motivation for sabrosa and wardell right it's almost like nothing to lose for them at this point just go all out balls to the wall and i and i think that they'll have that all in their minds and mm. that is a scary thought right yeah, so they go up against Immortals immediately, who are a team that have looked... I mean, the last time they played, Immortals fucking battered them and then immediately dropped out of the tournament, right? Like, that's, yep. that's literally what happened the last time these teams played. What Do you feel like that anything different is going to occur this time around? Well, the map pool is going to be different. DSM are not going to allow Haven and Bind to be in the pool. Um, and those were clearly Immortals' two best maps. In, in this current iteration when we saw them, I felt. Um, so th that's already going to be an immediate change. TSM are running a different comp than yeah, what yeah. they were running against Immortals previously. Um, Rosa playing more Sky, etc. Uh, they also don't have Brax, which is a difference. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. They just have the original roster. But, I mean, this is, this is a tough one to call. Well, how, where, I mean, it's early. Immortals it's at? in the quarterfinals, so Immortals should win, and then they'll lose immediately in the semis. <laughs> so, based off my current theory, they should they should dominate the in the quarterfinals fly? and then lose immediately in the semis. <laughs> is it the day fly theory? Is that what it's you're calling the, it? Yeah, it's it's the it is. It's exactly I mean, that. Well, not the day fly, fly, the, the day mayfly. Fly? Day fly was a I mean, the mayfly is a is a bug. Day fly was a player for the Philadelphia uh, Fusion. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Mayflower. That's a boat. I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> I would say ah. it doesn't even matter who wins that game because they're going to lose to NRG. But, Agreed. Right. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I think that. that Immortals wins this game, and I think that TSM, like, I don't know. Is, Immortals is banning Icebox recently? Is that, is that what's happening? Because TSM looks very, very weak on Icebox. I think that's, like, the one thing. I think Challengers won in the Stage 2. They were banning Icebox, and then this time they're kind of letting it through. But they they really haven't been tested too much. Uh, they lost to Sonics on the map, and yeah, I think Immortals will have a deeper pool. And, and I don't think that it goes the way that that Wyatt is suggesting in terms of like TSM trying not to play Haven and Ascent. I think they might honestly be left with no choice. Or, I think, sorry, Bind and Bind and Haven. I think they're going to play Haven. I think they are going to try and not play Bind, but Haven will make it through, especially considering they rolled Gen G. But that was also, the, they rolled Gen G. That was the very rare game where Sabrosa was playing Phoenix as well, and he actually farmed. When he was playing Phoenix previously in the games against Immortals, he was not a factor on, in the game on either map. Um, yeah. So I, I feel like they're going to be comfortable letting Haven through. I don't think Bind will be in this unless, I don't know, what, would TS, what else would TSM ban? And I, I think don't... TSM did ban binds so maybe you're right maybe they're prepping they, yeah they ban bind against sonics and gen G. yeah i, I yeah, don't think they, I, I think they just ban bind gone. and they have to play I, haven i'm just terrified of them on ice like <laughs> from what we've seen and it's been their permanent ban in the past 
It's just not been very good. Immortals' previous Icebox comp revolved around Nature playing Viper, right? What have they been True. doing since Rossi was on the team? Are I don't they going to lead into? It. I don't think they played it, right? Are they, they going to lead into it. playing no, the Viper time. again? I mean, they've been patch playing two point zero six. They've been playing a lot of Split. I would assume this series is Haven Ascent and Split. Um, I can see that. Yeah. Also, this is second week with Rossi. Rossi looked really good. Like this. Yeah. Is yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. You, I think I think from last last challenge, I think we're just like saying it's improved for them. Like, sure. Because the other big quarterfinal around the other big quarterfinal match that we've got is Cloud Nine against T One. I feel like that one's actually interesting to me. I, I assume Cloud Nine are going to be playing with Floppy, right? They are. So, yeah. How long has Floppy even been playing with them? What roles are they even going to play? Is he just going to straight plug into the role that the relics was previously occupying on the team playing Smokes? Oh, oh, I would Thieves hope classic. if they. I assume so, right? <laughs> Unless he's a duelist and they want Leaf to play Smokes. Which I wouldn't be I wouldn't be mad be at that either, because yeah. Leaf looked really good when he played Smokes. So I'm I'm fine if that's the case too, I think. Yeah, but he Well we know based so off the timeline he couldn't be playing that long because the C9 roster collapse is what, like <laughs> not that long ago? And the he was C9 still playing roster CSGO. Collapse. Like it was a supernova, a, a singularity <laughs> that occurred. I mean it sort of was team. in terms of like the, yeah. the vision they had for that CSGO team, calling it yeah, the fucking yeah. behemoth or what was it? What the, 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 <laughs> the Colossus. Colossus. You know? <laughs> that you know, it sort of was like they had all these and they all, it, it, to be fair, you know, it actually had really cool ideas for like, you know, contract transparency and all this other stuff for like a roster and esports, but it was still like when you did just put like he was literally committed to a CSGO team mere weeks you know yeah. months ago yeah, like yeah, right yeah, yeah. so it, it just simply can't have been that long yeah so hmm. i think that makes this match either What's yeah it happened? was not successful it wasn't no. success either right. for floppy it, like like no. for ethan for example with eg sure. like it wasn't so maybe I, there's um, no momentum there i find Sorry. that to be a very uh confounding variable that makes me find this match very difficult to predict like i, I don't really know who the favorites are coming into this i think i would have predicted Probably Cloud9, had they been running their previous roster. I was liking the way that they looked. But now, I I don't know. I mean, T1 have pl been playing decently recently. I think it's map-dependent again. What if Cloud9... I don't know what Cloud9 have been playing. I can't remember. Could you click on they one of the games, sense. Kurt, just to see the pick they ban really split. quick? Whatever the last they game was. Haven. It's version 1. They ban Bind. Okay, well, that's good for T1. Um, they pick Split. I mean, that's good... Listen, if the maps go in a similar way as to what Cloud9 have been doing, uh, mm -hmm. I would say T1. Right, because Cloud9 have been banning in their worst map. <laughs> yeah, they've been banning T1's worst map. They've been picking Split. T1 are good on Split? Sure. Yeah. I, I would probably favor T1. Or, you never know, though, because this is always could always just be a honeymoon-type beat. <laughs> they just come in and smash sure. them. So, uh, you know. That could always happen. Let but. me get your hot takes for who's actually going to qualify here, and we'll, we'll round out this segment. No, but I mean, there's oh. going to be two teams that qualify. <laughs> uh, sorry, there's going to be four, four teams, teams that yeah. qualify four. from this. Yeah. So that makes this, I mean, we're going to end up with some kind of mediocre teams getting through, I feel, into the, the NA Challengers finals. It doesn't feel like a stacked lineup. Like Masters 1 had that impression to me of like, no. wow, this is deep. It feels like, yeah, it feels like NA is a little weak once you compare get down it to Europe. The they're, you, they're, they're fighting for scraps back there. Like they're <laughs> over there, just there's a the little scrap of food, and you have like eight people fighting on the ground for that. And in, your, and in NA, everyone's like, okay, you're through, you're through, you're through. It feels like that movie Snowpiercer where they have like the people in the back of the train, and they <laughs> yeah. like that's Europe right now fighting for fucking qualification. <laughs> Okay, so who are the four teams that you would have going through? Sentinels, number one, definitely, right? If they get upset here, yeah. that would be outrageous. My, my number two has, it, it's NRG. NRG, sure. yeah, NRG. I NRG, agree. their roster right now, the, the level of firepower on that roster is fucking nutty. Okay. I mean, it's just ridiculous. They have to be my number two. And they're, they're just a more solid, if, in the general sense of teamwork, they're, they're better now. Okay. Um. So that's my number two, but then past that, <laughs> yeah. Where the heck uh, yeah. Are you past, past that. that I, I mean, have... C9 oh. is such a wild card because before, like you said, Josh, if they had kept the same roster, I'd be like C9. I think C9 would make it through. But now I'm like, maybe depending on how they perform. Like I honestly, it's really tough to tell. Like realistically, based off their past performances, I would say Immortal should come through. 
but then you know they're going to hit semifinals and then they're all going to turn off their monitors and so then like i so i don't know i just don't know <laughs> i'm not sure yeah i i mean i imagine one of cloud9 or t1 will end up going through because one of them is guaranteed to go to the upper semifinals which means when you get to the lower bracket you only need to win one game to qualify yeah right that's the way the bracket works out I think. yeah but they're guaranteed to lose the sentinels anyway so it's like doesn't really give them that yeah but but at least then they only have to win one game against like an Immortals, TSM, or a BBG, you know? Are we sleeping on like Antbox? No, no, I don't think so. I don't okay. think we are. Are we? <laughs> I, don't know. I was just asking. I, I don't feel They're good about Antbox at all, but I, wait, wait, I haven't wait. watched them recently. Kirk, can you click on Antbox really quick? I, I, don't, they I, mean, I don't think Vikes they look Lada anything... Now. They don't. They don't look drastically different than they did before. Yeah, not, they look like go, fine. Go still. up. Go up to the. I just want to see the matches really quick. All oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't. Yeah. They don't look drastically different. You know, like it's just. It's just and. All, right, all, right, all right. Go back. Go, 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 go back to the bracket. <laughs> I mean, even even just looking at it logically, they play Sentinels first. They're gonna lose that match, and yeah. then they have to play the the loser of Cloud Nine Blue versus T One. Yeah. They're going out first round. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I was just posing a question. All right. But I don't know. I, I don't know about Immortals. I have no confidence in Immortals. I have no confidence in TSM. None of these teams inspire confidence in me. But some of them will make it through. I'm get, Okay, I'll say T1. <laughs> I think T1 yeah, is maybe my third. I, I think that BBG is a dark horse. I don't think that they can get through, but I just have no clue because of like the new stuff because they obviously were prepping i mean when we did the back chat with poach they were obviously pep prepping viper astra um, but imagine if bbg just pound their way through this what, like what i have is c9 blue and t1 as both the, of them the making it two. through both yeah of them. i mean one of them would have to yeah they both actually have to make it through the opposite sides of the lower bracket and meet kind of in the in that round uh, to yeah. to get the fourth spot so they'd have yep. to knock everybody else out on their way through the lower bracket because one of them's going down there immediately and the other one's going down there as soon as they lose the Sentinels. <laughs> so, yep. yeah, I mean, that's... I think Cloud9 Blue have an possible. easy path once they get, like, if they go lower... Whoever, either C9 Blue or T1 go lower bracket, and I think they have an easy path because it's going to be Anbox first and then they'll play the loser of that lower semifinals, which is NRG Immortals most likely or, or NRG TSM. Oh, something like that. And I, I think that they they can do it. Yeah, they beat they beat Immortals reasonable. last time with without floppy, with relics. All right, well, let's move on from the uh, the front of the train to the back of the train. I think because it's time for some fucking carnage. North America's got oh some lovely teams up in that top eight. Who's gonna get to Iceland? It's all open. Anyone can make it. But we don't have that much confidence in the bottom teams. EU is a fucking scrap right now. People are bashing heads in the parking lot and whipping out glass bottles at LAN. <laughs> it's fucking <laughs> mental. Um, I've been watching a lot of the European scene because I knew that you guys were hot in NA and I don't have as much time with Overwatch League starting. Um, EU is fucking mental right now. It's actually mm. so competitive and so deep. It's crazy. Yep. Um, the EU Challengers 2 just finished, so we have our teams that are going to EMEA, the top four. So I wanted to go for a recap of like the games that happened this week um, because we had some big upsets again. In terms of the teams that were expected to qualify, I think people would have had Ascend, the former winners of Masters, making it through. People were pretty high on G2, potentially. BDS. Because, yeah, BDS are yeah, the... Yeah, BDS, yeah. The on-paper favorites were Ascend and BDS. Dark yep. Horses, G2 just beat Heretics. And Fnatic and Liquid had just made roster changes. We did this kind of preview of this bracket last week. And, I mean, we saw some mental shit go down. I think I want to start with Ascend. Um, yes, you should. Because that match was crazy. That match was nuts. What happened here? Yeah, this... I mean, they... It's really weird watching this team play. Because you remember the magic that they were able to pull out at Masters 1. And it's not mm -hmm. like phase where they've dropped off a cliff, but they're trying to run very similar stuff and they just don't quite have the magic there. It, it feels like they needed that extra oomph to kick them over the top and make them world beaters. And everyone's still playing pretty well, but they're not lighting the world on fire anymore. And, and this game was an absolute scrap. I mean, what was it? OT on both of the first two maps? It was OT on both of them, yeah. And Killian's on Icebox? 
that guy pounded so the hardest I've seen someone pound for a while, honestly, on Icebox. Like, and they just couldn't, they just couldn't clinch it. They just couldn't finish it out. Like, they were getting good frags, but like, honestly, Vitality, they looked so much better in this match than they had recently. They looked really good, like on this match. I think like, this yeah, was like much the better. first look at like a like a god tier jet versus another god tier jet, like. CNED versus um what's his name Brams, Brams. on Vitality. Yeah, Brams was playing really Absolutely well. Absolutely insane. Than it was usual. so much fun to watch. Um, but in terms of the result, I I think Sen kind of choked OT. Like they just hadn't they they flopped in OT. Like literally nothing. They tried some weird stuff and it just didn't work. And they would go down in man situations and then have to try to clutch. Um, yeah, it was really weird too because. That wasn't the types of calls that we kind of saw in in Masters, and I haven't really seen them make those kinds of Hail Mary calls either. It felt like they just were like, okay, it's OT. Let's try something completely out of the out of the norm for us. And it just didn't work. Like they would five push C long on Haven and one of the know. one of the other big things that I thought was excellent for them at Masters was their decision making in terms of when they were gonna make aggressive plays and when they were gonna play advantage situations. Mm -hmm. And that kind of structure, that discipline, but also the like calculated risk taking based on reads of their opponent seem to not quite be there in this run. And I can't help but wonder whether that's to do with their coach not being in the comms. Or or I mean fuck knows, you know. <laughs> we don't we I mean the casters made the same observation. Like they just like do they need their coach to help make some calls here? Because legitimately but it's it seems like it could. It's pure speculation from us at this point. I want to talk to the team about it as well. And I've been I've been in the process of trying to get bone called onto back chat. So that might be our guest for next week as well. To Let's try and go. talk through that kind of stuff. I, I think, because that was yeah. like you have to consider that narrative now with Ascend going on this like insane run, overperforming expectations, blasting all of the top teams, and then cooling off again immediately afterwards. I think Vitality might have been a bad matchup for them actually, too. I think in both games, despite losing to Fnatic in the next game, I think Vitality showed um, uh, that they're, they're good at absorbing aggression and, and countering it. Like, they, they play very well against the aggressive teams. Like, specifically um, on Haven, too. Like, Ascend are pretty active on, on the Haven defense, and so were Fnatic. And on both games, Vitality just neutralized any aggression. Mm. Um, I think that it actually just, I think it might have been a bit of a bad matchup for them. I was impressed with the Vitality in this game and the Fnatic game too, honestly. Well, the Vitality just made two roster moves as well, adding yeah. Jesmond and Loki. And I think that those did very well for the team. Um, I, I've, been, I've been a fan of Loki. I think he's very individually skilled. And I think moving him over to this role is a great one for him too. Because he's incentivized to kind of keep himself alive a bit more than he would previously. Uh, he was a, very much a risk taker when he played it, it, for prior teams. Like he was playing for Linstitute and he was playing the Jet, he was playing the Sage, and he was just trying to like, uh, like make these really aggro pushes and play, make info plays. And if you're aware of how he played, he gets caught out quite a lot. But now that he's in the, um, a slightly different role for this team, He's in a role where he has to prioritize his life a bit more, and I think that has created a good balance for him, where he's still got the skill, but he's also having to think about preserving his own life and being a bit more calculated in the risks he's taking. Yeah, yeah Vitality looked like a, a decent team I, on the come-up. I, I, yeah, I think by next, um, you know, first stage, I mean, yeah, the next time we see Vitality, it'll be like stage three, right? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I think by then, they're going to be another top contending team. I, I was very impressed with, with the, the level up and, and where they were at in this tournament, despite going out, but to the winners. Um, right, right. Uh, yeah, and so let's, let's maybe move on to talking about Fnatic too, because they made some roster changes and they end up... Holy I crap. mean, I am such a fan of this Fnatic roster. I Same. really am a believer. I know that we can, you know, we can address like a honeymoon period or something like that, but this team just, they fucking got it. I don't know. <laughs> it they have it they come out with a big win over g2 where they just i mean they kind of flattened them i mean they stepped on them yeah they, they yeah. controlled the i mean pace on bind the in particular game. they ruined them they ruined them on bind yeah i don't Bro, know why g2 they were wanted too. to go to bind uh, yeah i don't know it's fanatic has it's been their best map like you could you could argue at various periods that fanatic were the best team in the world on bind they invented this strategy of playing the silver sky with the viper and they just 
opted into it. Yeah. I, I, I mean, F Fnatic on bind attack just ruined them. G um, G2 also tweeted, uh, El Royo, I think he's called, the, the analyst of G2. Rojo. El Rojo, sorry. He, um, <clears throat> he tweeted saying, uh, saying, are you ready to get counter stratted on bind? <laughs> and then they go, uh-oh. <laughs> the, the thing is, though. He lacked the critical information. <laughs> but G2 actually did a good job of holding Fnatic's comp to only, uh, what was it, six rounds on attack? I think they ended the first half 6-6, six, six, didn't they? Or maybe it was 5-7. But it was, it was pretty even. And what? Fnatic's comp is good at attack. Yeah. They it was 5-7. Yeah, it yeah, was 5-7. Yeah. Yeah. But after they lose the pistol, G2 actually did a decent job in that first half. And then they just fought, it all just G2, flew out okay. the fucking window. Okay, okay. I will say, though, when you say G2 did a decent job, Paddy Tech did a decent job. Yeah, Paddy Tech had pretty beast. The rounds yeah. they won were Paddy Tech-related miracles of him <laughs> finding... I mean, genuinely, there was the one play where he was in spawn. He won, like, a 1v3 on Reyna. He yes, was, that pa was Paddy crazy. Tech feasts on Reyna. That it has does, been yeah. the, the, the bright spot of G2. It's as a good of change. And it, and it raises questions for what's going to happen when Zeke re enters the lineup because he was trying to play that Duelist role for them. And I don't think is that, that the plan? Zeke's coming back? I think so. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Ozzy, Ozzy said he's not with you. He, he was anymore. just standing in for this? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I think the plan was always for Zeke to come back. He, oh, he genuinely did just have a temporary issue that he, what was it, like a. COVID. He, got, he and his family got COVID and he couldn't right, come yeah. to the. Oh, I, to, told, to I the boot totally camp. missed that. I thought they were just trying someone new i mean I they, that completely, they but. might still do that but yeah. it seems like zk is gonna rejoin okay. the team gotcha uh, but it seems like a role shift is needed here for 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 zeke coming back in because paddy tech's doing much better on duelist someone needs to pick up that smoke role probably but his, his zeke has played smokes ridiculous. in the past too so yeah yeah his reina is just ridiculous but that in the entirety of that game Fnatic just controlled the pace yeah they were aggressive on both sides every round they were straight up Smeagin, but with good utility and trading. Durka and Doma as an attacking duo is just phenomenal. It's just it's phenomenal. Yeah. The, the, fact that, the fact that Dirk is good enough that Doma can be the second guy it has just opened the floodgates for this team. They have such a... I, I didn't really mm -hmm. think I was going to say this because I really did rate Mo pretty well, but they have a massive firepower increase. Dirk yep. is a beast. And... It really does feel like, okay, if you get past Durka, Dome is right there next to him. It's, they've got a dangerous team right now because they're combining the great tactical and strategic mind of Boaster with the firepower of the other top European teams. They have mm -hmm. that to be able to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. They can play against aggressive teams now because their players aren't scared to get in their faces and challenge mm -hmm. them. This, in my mind, these two guys have fit all of Fnatic's problems. And like what you're saying, in my mind, the firepower is such so lacking that they always went for this late round play, this this you know post plant setup, all oh, this, this stuff. Was... Boaster has felt like everybody's always like, yeah, he's a good fragging IGL, but it always felt like he was trying to fill the gaps that they were not able to you know clear this corner properly or do whatever. Like you always found him in this most ridiculous situations. Now it feels like he's unlocked, doesn't have to do that. Definitely, and. It gives them that extra gear. They don't have to play late round anymore. They can sneak straight into this sophisticated sure, yeah, sneak, yeah. of course, because they have Boaster, you know, but like they can just get in your face and do such amazing things. Also Magnum too. Like he's, he's yeah, I think Magnum as well. Magnum Ridiculous. Sky, like really, really good. Like, I mean, I didn't Much really have a Shax. problem with, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have a problem with Shaq with like other supporting roles, but his Sky was definitely not like amazing. And Magnum Sky is very impactful currently. Like they just have, this is yeah. really just a new fanatic. It's also, right now. it's a new. It's fanatic. also been a learning process for Magnum. This, I think, was the first time that he was playing Sky, and the first couple of showings on it, he looked like he was still learning. And yet, mm -hmm. the he the improvement has been dramatic. Like he seems like he's just a guy that can learn how to play other agents really, really quickly. Um. He was a raise player to start with on his Czech team originally, like when we were watching him at first strike. Then he transitions into a sentinel role, and he's learned. He's got so many fucking TikTok setups and shit like that that are actually yeah. really well thought out. Um, and just the, he seems like a player that puts in a lot of time to his own game. He has a lot of different cam setups, a lot of different utility setups. He's thinking about how they want to combo the Killjoy and the Astra stuff. Um, yep. When they're playing Haven with with that setup with Boaster on the Astra, 
And then when he plays the Sky, the improvement has been meteoric to the point where he's now really fucking good on Sky. I, I just feel so good about this team. I also feel good about them because I know that they're going to put time into learning Viper and not just learning it, but like implementing it properly. Other teams might pick up Viper because she's overpowered when it comes to EMEA finals or, or Iceland yeah. if they manage to get there. Boaster already had put the time into Viper and learning that shit. And now it's just going to be even more powerful. I think as well, one of the nice things with, with this lineup too is that it just unlocks different comps that they can run. Like, I, I really liked Doma's Sage. Too. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, uh, the, the solo duelist Durka Jet look was really nice. And when they were putting him in position to find a kill, he was finding it. Like, yeah. God goddamn, the pistol round on this game was nasty. Um, like, they just set him up to find kills in, in all these situations, and he, he consistently delivered throughout the tournament. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very high on this team. Uh, I think that they should do well when it comes to EMEA, but we'll get onto that later on. Uh, what the hell was the, the, the next, the other part of the bracket? Oh, Liquid, if we want right. to talk about Liquid. Liquid, yeah. It was Let's... BDS and IP and then Liquid. Liquid and BDS, I think we're both very yeah. interesting on I that think, side of the bracket. I think I want to talk about um, a BDS first, actually, because the opening game for Liquid was a bit of a gimme because they were just playing mm -hmm. against yeah. CE Calling, yeah. who I'm, I, I'm not particularly big on. I don't know too much about them. They haven't done anything before. Um, but BDS against NIP was a game that happened way too early in the bracket, I feel. But it's still... It feels like both of those teams still have some little pieces lacking from their game. NIP show some phenomenal moments to how they play. But then there's still some rounds and like some attacking rounds where they're just so easily read and some uh, synergy moments where it just all falls to pieces. They're a team with such high potential, but they, they're still missing the mark on terms of being like tier one within Europe. Uh, it was still a fantastic game though. I felt really really sorry for both of these teams vds and nip in their series they had that huge delay right where right, the yeah. game started yeah. and then they literally had to wait for the other series to end and then they played again and nip was leading on haven they end up closing out that game but then they just get rolled on the other two. Oh right yeah that's and why the stats I, aren't there on vlr actually yeah exactly so i i feel kind of bad here because to me this this looks like NIP just got tilted. <laughs> but I didn't get to, like, f I think I watched a little bit of the second one, and then I, and I had, to, had to leave. So they didn't yeah. feel like they had any fire, firepower left on the second map. Yeah, it's... Yeah, um... I kind of feel the same, honestly. I, I only got to see, like, the first part of this map, and then the giant, like, or the first, like, part of it, and then the giant delay started happening. I was like, well, I don't have five hours to watch a single match. Time to leave. <laughs> There are the, such things as VOD. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, that's, that's what I did. I, I watched watch VOD, the VOD and just skipped either. five hours. So uh, don't get affected by stuff like that. I forgot there was even a pause. Um, the, the real match, the match of like the, not the match of the tournament maybe, but the match that defined the most in the tournament in terms yeah. of the end results was BDS Liquid for me. I, like, mean... That re I mean, that changed which team qualified. That is a huge deal. And yeah. it's also a match where I feel like BDS should have won. <laughs> it was, and I'm not saying uh, yeah, that BDS yeah. didn't make mistakes. They definitely did make mistakes, and Bala's died, so we've replaced him Goodbye, with some our stats. Um, but they should have been in control of this game with, once it got to bind. Um, they, yeah. they, they squeaked out the win on Haven. Neither of these teams look that great on Haven. They're both trying to play the Phoenix Jet and the, the combo in systems don't seem that great with the Astra. I wasn't impressed that much with either of the teams on Haven. But then on Bind, I felt like... Really? Yeah. I, I like BDS's Haven. I think it's all right. I think they were pretty... I, I like the comp that they were running. I thought Akuma was really good on Astra. Yes, Akuma is good on Astra. But like the, the things that they do, for example, Akuma always trying to push out of his smoking garage mm -hmm. was was getting red and caught by Liquid, and I think that, that that threat has been overplayed too much. And the Hoppy Takas duo, the way that you have to play the Phoenix and the Jet, I think puts a lot of pressure on the rest of your team to fill the gaps across the rest of the map. Because Hoppy and sure. Takas like to play like aggro up on A, and I think it just opens windows for other teams to try and... It's not like trying to play it with a Sage or trying to play it with a Sky or a Raze where you can use your utility to, to stack properly in other areas and like make reads on your, your opponent. I think that they end up um, 
having to, I don't know, having to spread themselves a bit too thin when it comes to Haven. Sure. Even though I, when, when they have impact, the impact is visible and obvious and pretty good. And like Oppy and Akuma have some good synergy, like the flashes through the Astro Walls, that kind of stuff. They have good ideas of how they want to play, but I don't think it's top, top level Haven yet. I, I think that's fair, but I think they have something there. And especially with as, as they further develop how they want to play around the asterisks, I think Akuma was one of the better asterisks um, that, that we've seen so far. Um, and also, I think to win that map against Liquid, I always feel that Haven is one of Liquid's better maps. And against, a, they, they won despite Scream Drop in 30, whatever. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, For is, sure. Is nothing to scoff at. Um, however, on Bind... They were yeah. in position to close out the series. I, I mean, they should have won the series. And Link, Link might have saved the careers of his teammates in that game. <laughs> Genuinely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he might have <laughs> saved the team, their salaries, their livelihoods, by winning that 1v4 and yeah. dragging them back into the game. And then at the very end, the biggest difference for me from map one into the end of map two when they won an ascent is Yampy finding value. That's, that, is what it, 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 that is the number one thing it boiled down to for me. At the end of that bind game, when, when he was entering over towards A, he started finding a bunch of kills on all the rounds. Yeah. And on Ascent, he was farming. And uh, also his, his opping. His um, opping is very good. His opping is extremely consistent. But, but for me, it's his entering. Does his entering find value? Yeah. If yes, Liquid win. If no, can Scream get seven kills? Yeah, I mean, his That's, entering on Haven was actually troll. It was like... I was not good. No. I mean, Scream was picking up... He was dragging them to a close game. Yeah. In, yeah. in, in those rounds. Because the, the theory makes sense that Yampi can go and, like, schmeeg his way in and Scream will clean up. But Yampi, it feels like he's... He just doesn't get what is too aggressive and what is reasonable aggression in the game yet. I think it's inexperienced, but he's also trying to push the limits way too it's, far to the point where he's just doing nonsense shit. I, it seems like he doesn't... He does things without having an idea as to how the other team will actually react to them. Yeah. Like, I think he... It seems like he thinks the things that he goes for will potentially confuse... or the, There's like an outplay within what he's doing. Yeah. Just using the abilities is like the outplay. You actually, he's not finding a timing for them, though. He's not finding a good window yeah. to use them. Hello, Bala. Hey. He's back. He's back. Somebody just hit me off. I, I don't know. I just couldn't get on Discord. <laughs> huh. That's oh, weird. Okay. We just Absolutely boxed you out. I still, I still think, though, this Liquid roster has strong potential, though. Even though, like, I agree with all the Yampy criticisms, I still feel like they're, they still, as long as Yampy finds his legs, and I think he has like the, the the basics to do so. You know, he's got strong he's got strong mechanics, right? He does, yeah. I, yeah. I do feel that they can find a solution that really works for them and find the timings that really works for their entering for this strat. Because I think yeah. this is still a far better look than I think people were expecting them this early on for their swap. So, Absolutely. I mean, I didn't expect yeah. them to beat BDS in the slightest. The, the bind, though, I mean, it was such a throw from BDS, man. What, what I disliked about it was BDS were up to a big advantage. I think there was something like 11-6 up, 11-7, something like, like 11, that. 11-7. Yeah. And um, what had been winning them defensive rounds up until that point, um, when we see to like round, what is that, like round 16, round 17, something like that, when... Oh, there we go. I can read the numbers again. Up to round something like round 19, what they were doing very well was these fast retakes. You can see 15, 16, 17, these fast retakes were coming in, especially on the A site, where they'd get set up and then immediately, as soon as the bomb starts getting planted, boom, these big retakes are coming through. And they were way more coordinated than Liquid were. were than they were way more coordinated than Liquid was. That's terrible grammar. Um, were. But Roden and... Uh, Roden on the, the Sova and then also uh, Takas on, on Raze were able to just wrap back in and execute these really fast retakes. And then for some reason, even though it was working, halfway through their defensive half, BDS decided to try and shut down the pushes as they were coming in through the choke points. And I don't know whether that was because 
even though they were winning, the rounds were coming down to 1v1s at the end. BDS were advantaged and closing them out, but maybe they thought it was just getting too close, and so they wanted a change of strategy anyway. But they started trying to, like, shut Liquid down as they went for the short push. And, like, having people play the crossfire from Lamps and Pocket, or on B, they're trying to face and double-hold Hookah with their Rays and their Breach. And they just started making mistake after mistake after mistake. And what had been working for them on their defensive half, they didn't even attempt anymore. And they, they lost it. They fucking threw it away. It wasn't just the big clutch moments from Liquid. They were being given the opportunities to clutch because BDS started shifting away from what had worked for them. I, I didn't get this. It felt like a collapse mentally in terms of the like IGLing or something from, from BDS. Yeah. I thought it was the late the late rounds. I don't know if we, we talked about Link already, but a little bit, yeah. We didn't watch his clips yet, clutches, but yeah. one before like this. Do you man... remember what round that was, Bala? Uh, no, I don't. It, it, it was... should say on VLR if you look at like the one the three Ks or the one VXs. I think it should say what round it was. Yeah, in, it maybe. says it says one v four, but it doesn't say what round uh, it was right. in. That's yeah, unfortunate. Because yeah, yeah um, Link no really did create magic. eleven at that point. So maybe yeah, it was that. late in the game, but... and honestly, like. The, they lost a lot of these little tiny situations. I don't know if Bind was the map. Yeah, no, I mean, like, everybody. Was, they yeah. had so much more 1v1s, like, stat-wise and anything. And I think that's what it came down to. So yeah. sometimes that's the way the cookie crumbles. I, I, I personally didn't see too much wrong. I mean, you guys probably have already broken down the gameplay of BDS. But, like, it felt like it was those situations more than anything that slightly misplayed and the game could have gone the other way. There were even more. I mean, Ascent was a bit more of a blowout, and Yampy was really good on that map. But uh, there were a lot of those situations on Ascent as well. Where yes. Just yeah. Every clutch well, came down to just, okay, Link wins another 1v1. I okay, think Link wins the a players 1v2. were kind of boomed there, though, as well. <laughs> yeah. Because even though the strategy seemed good from BDS, the rifling dropped off a cliff. Logan had the worst game that he's ever had. I mean, this entire match was pretty poor from Logan in terms of his rifling, a guy that we normally are bigging up every time by his clutches, his. First puller accuracy, Logan didn't really turn up. And Akuma, a player who's also normally really big for this team, was good in the first two maps and then fell off a cliff when it came to his rifling on Ascent. It yeah. felt like the blow of losing Bind really got to them. And not in the terms of like their plans fell to pieces, but they're just, the duels that they were taking were, were weak and without confidence. And then they ended up losing them. And Liquid steamrolled over the top of them. I mean, that 1v4 is enough to break unbind is enough to break like anyone's mental honestly especially Especially. when you're in such a like high pressure situation it's just like a really rough situation as a player to be in yeah yeah i mean it's if they win that the game is essentially over yeah and it's just a wrap but yeah here we go yeah link i mean that that killing elbow quite nice this next one is a beastie kill because takas is holding a nice angle there Oh. He just misses the shot and Link immediately dumps him. A little, little Ferrari peak. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, is, that is a straight up Ferrari peak. Yeah, and at this point, this is what I'm talking about with Logan too. At the end of this, you'll see that Akuma, like, they, they try and double push to clear Link after he plants the spike. Akuma goes first, gets picked, and you expect Logan to, you know, jump around the corner and try and trade him out. And Logan just continues slow walking into his crosshair and dies. <laughs> I feel like Logan's head wasn't in this match. Um, yeah, and it made a, uh, you know, the, the, this game was on an edge. It was on a knife's edge. So those tiny things, they really do change the entire course of the series. My question yeah. is, how do we feel about Liquid moving forward now? Are we confident in them, despite them having qualified? Is our level of confidence low? Because personally, mine is. Mine is. I don't. Same. I, I'm worried about. Uh, look at how look at how I mean, it's you see insane. how but, yeah. how lethargic that is from Logan. Yeah, it's just slow. Yeah, it's it's slow just keeps slow walking I, into it. My my worries are, and I'm not taking this from the I'm not I'm not <laughs> taking this from the Yampy final against Fnatic because I don't know what to make of any of that game. So I've kind <laughs> of just decided to remove that from my mind a yeah. little bit. Um, but more so from Yampy in this game. I think the dependency on him finding value on his entries was so clear for, for, for me. Um, and if he struggles to find more or even just a, a, a fairly consistent level of kills on his entry or more value on his entry rather than just getting blown up as soon as he dashes updrafts in, 
If, if he can't find more value, I don't think Liquid has uh, much of a chance to, to, to make it through this bracket. I also am a little bit worried about some of the other players on the team because I just think it is so dependent on, on fucking Yampi and Scream right now. Yeah, I, I, they've, had, they've had situations where those guys have choked in big games before yeah, as well, or at least it's appeared like that from the outside. So this is now the biggest games that they've had is uh, the EMEA finals. And, so. and, and Link, Link was playing very well, obviously. Um, but so, Soulcast too. I mean, he was he had okay. a lot of hype behind him. So apparently Soulcast okay. is IGLing for them as well. It's a mixture oh, of Soulcast and Scream. I thought it was Link IGLing, but it's not. It's apparently Scream and Soulcast who okay. are IGLing for them. Uh, which... I, I have concerns with the other players being able to pick up the pieces in some of these rounds. Um, and especially if there are going to be rounds where Yampi, we're just playing 4v5. Yeah, because Yampi ints. Because that's the thing. Yampi doesn't make high-risk, high-reward plays. He hasn't figured that out yet. He either makes really good plays or he hard feeds. Like the, the plays that he goes for that are so, they're, they're so ridiculous that he is just feeding. There's no world in which they work unless you're playing ranked or something. And even so, then though, it's... Yeah, I mean, some, it, of, he, he, some of the stuff is... Yeah. yeah. But, but I think that if they can tone that down, if they can put a bit of a leash on him and at least explain oh, to him why yeah. some of those plays don't work... You're going to take away the rounds that Yampi loses for you, and you're just going to have the rounds that Yampi wins That's for you. That's the key. I think yeah. that is the key for this team to, to really level up from here. I, I, think, I think they have decent potential. The fact that they now have two potential carry factors in both Yampi and, and Scream, I think, fixes the whole, like, the whole, let's build a roster around one player, right? Now it's kind of centered around both of them, and I think that that is good. Um, I know you guys have already talked about Yampi a lot, but I, I actually feel like him playing Jet is very, very nice. But because Jet's skill ceiling is so high, he finds himself in these really, really confusing situations being fairly new relative to everybody yeah, yeah. else, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's something they want to fix. I don't know if that's something they want to try to tone it down, but I, I think he still has a large way to go in terms of that Jet skill ceiling. And I think he can do it. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm more worried about the other topic that's that's kind of later in this regard than anything else. Almost. Oh well. For some well, let's, I don't know let's, why. Let's touch on that now, actually, just to uh, take a bit of a tangent away because we've covered most of the big teams that were in this in this tournament so far. So Yampi is now officially unbanned from CS:GO. They changed the policy in terms of how it works. So now it's like if it's more than five years ago that you got a VAC ban, you're as long as it was before you started competing in like major tournaments. Mm you are no longer banned from competing within the major circuit in CS. I think it's five years, right? Five years. Right. And his was eight years ago. So he is now unbanned. He's allowed to participate in the major circuit for CS. And that's the game that he grew up playing. That's the game that he got his success playing. That's the game that he would be playing if he had been allowed. He has said that he doesn't know what he's going to do. He's not thinking about it. He's just focused on Iceland. There's been a lot of speculation about what this guy's, you know, thinking though. You're not, you're not, nobody's inside his head, but yep. you can make some kind of. The, the answers that he on gave things. on, inter, like on his stream and, and just in general were not inspiring confidence for him wanting to, wanting Stay to Stay in Valorant. Yeah. You know, it, it clear. I like the answer. I like it. You know, like, like I'm focused on Iceland for sure. But I don't know. <laughs> that that it might be irrational for me to feel this way, but that's that's really where I am struggling to rate Liquid higher is because of the ways that I just don't feel inspired by his confidence that he's fully committed. I mean, what do you even do in that situation though? Like you just you have to just like get through the event if you're liquid, right? And mm -hmm. I mean hopefully Yampy is staying committed because like, it's not like Yampy is going to be able to be doing a lot of hunting while they're doing their prep for Iceland anyways. Um, so, I mean, I, I still think the same criticisms we applied before are like, that's more of like a long-term worry for liquid more than an Iceland worry. I feel because like, you don't think it'll hang over them. He's not going, what's up? You don't think it'll hang over them a bit and have the like? I mean, it'll probably hang over them, but I mean, what are you gonna do? Like, you just I have mean, to have that a frank situation, discussion. That's all, right? Like, it's, yeah, they it just have a frank simple. discussion and just like realize, like, hey, we're committed to Iceland and blah 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 blah, right? Like, but it is worrying in that, like, 
for me, the one worry when it comes to the short term is like if they ever if they get to Iceland and then they're performing like they're having a rough time or something, it's very possible for Yampy, young guy, you know if he can just go back to CSGO, just be like, eh, and just kind of like check out in like the situations where you need someone to be like mentally there. Like they have to be like full on, like I'm playing, like we need to win this game. We have to win this game. Like we have to be like fully committed. And that's the really worrying short term for Liquid is more so than Yampy's like actual play or not more so, but you know, equal to is that will he be as mentally committed when the, when times are tough and the team is down rounds, is he going to be willing to like go the extra 110% you need to have like that mental fortitude when he just can be like, ah, I'm going to go to CSGO. You know, yeah, I, I I don't think it'll hang over them too much. I mean, I think they're. He said himself that uh, he's you know they're staying focused on this for now. Um, it would be a sh for, for Valorant. It would be unfortunate if he did decide to go back because he does have a. I mean, I think he has an immense amount of potential. Yeah. In yeah, fact, yeah. I think he's on the cusp. The thing about it is that where he's going wrong is just so. It couldn't be any clearer, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's it's his mistakes it's, are so obvious, they're so, they're so easy evident. to fix. Yeah, that it's like you're right there <laughs> because when he's not doing that, his rifling is sick, his opping is sick, and there are plenty of rounds. Like at the end of that bind game, it wasn't just Link with the clutch. After that, and in the OT, Yampy's just okay. We're hitting A. Great. I'm gonna walk in and I'm gonna headshot four guys. I mean, it's <laughs> alone, just swinging all of them. I mean, he he is a, a he has nasty moments. Um, so. yeah. scares me for any other top CS pros. Holy crap! Because EU's been been unlucky or lucky, however you want to see it. Cool. In yeah. terms of the top, 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 top CS pros coming over. Yeah. So yeah. it's just interesting. It's it gives them a huge amount of firepower in the short term. I, I don't know, man. The, the a lot of people have been bringing up the idea of well, Yampi probably wouldn't be able to find a tier one contract in CS immediately, so he's going to end up being paid less. There's no, I don't think there's any world in which Yampi's really thinking about his paycheck. The guy's, he's young, he's been involved in CS for ages. If he goes back to CS, it's because he loves the game. It's not because mm -hmm. he's looking for a paycheck or, yeah. or worried about like... Which, by the way, like anything. huge like congrats to being, for this whole thing to be happening. Like yeah, this is I a mean, vindication for him. Like this absolutely. is really good. You do you, like... If you want to go and play CS, if that's your passion, if that's the esport that you want to compete in, go do it. Fuck yeah. Like, yeah. absolutely. I, I want to see people playing the game that they want to play. Like, make a career in the place that where you want to play it. The, yep. the, the Yampi situation is just awesome because he could choose either if he yeah. wants to. He, he can just go wherever the hell he wants. The in, in some ways, the opposite of, like, the Zeppa yeah. thing where it's... That's not... That's what we don't want. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't yeah. want players to feel like they have to. By, to by the something. way, if anybody didn't know, like Yampi tried for years to get unbanned from set from get his back ban. He off sued the Valve for yeah. yeah. He sued. Well, I think he sued like the whatever. Sued I don't Gabe know Newell. the details on that one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but he did try for years, and they just wouldn't budge. They just wouldn't budge. And then what is it like? Two months after he transitions, they're like, hey, yeah. yeah, you can come back. <laughs> yeah, luring them back over. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that might have been part of it, you know? Like, CS is actively fighting with Valorant to keep the health of its scene active right now and, like, have some of these guys st stay involved because NACS is looking tragic and, you know, the bigger Valorant gets, the more enticing it becomes to other people whose careers are limited in some way, like, for example, yep. with the Vax situation. I think it's a good decision from the Valve guys over at CS yeah. or the CS guys over at Valve. Um, right. Let's take a look then at the EMEA bracket. Oh, actually, no. The next thing to look at, because EMEA is a collection of Europe and mm. uh, Turkey and CIS, there's been a lot of discussion in the scene. There was a lot of discussion after we interviewed Nucky as well, and he said that they had gone like 3-97 and 97 against Gambit yeah. <laughs> in scrims about how good Turkey and CIS are actually going to be. Um, have any of you guys been able to catch the games? Because I spent some time last night just grinding VODs of Turkey and CIS to try and answer this question. But I want to kind of open the floor to expectations or rumors from the community or stuff like that before I just waffle for I've a while. I've seen games from CIS. I have not seen much from Turkey still. Yeah, I, I watched it. the CIS final. I partially watched the Turkey, the Turkey final with BBL. Um, but I 
want I'm going to go back and watch the the Challengers one final from Turkey, which I think has the the stronger teams, which is the what, football football is and name? oxygen and yeah. oxygen. Yeah, I want to go back and watch those. But um, yeah, man, the Gambit game was was impressive, but it wasn't the level of impressive that I was expecting to get out of right. Nookie's interview and all the other scrim bucks going around. Yeah, like there was yeah. some clips and stuff like that, like about like G two playing that, like a whole bunch of stuff. Um, my mind, this is this is another case of scrim bucks fraud and <laughs> people trying to catch oh, them. Yeah, in. like yeah. Avas knows all about. <laughs> I know it. all about that. I know all about that. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. just like le legit. The Gambit games, they, they're nice. They have really good, like, Nats is very strong. Um, I, I don't have Nats any of the great, other players yeah. ingrained in my in my brain, but, like, the, and, and the team they faced, Gambit, in their final was very good, too. Like, their Haven really impressed the crap out of me. Um, I think Gambit's style is simple, to put it to, like, it's simple, it's clean, and it is a high level of simplistic... I, I don't know. It doesn't feel like they're running anything crazy. They have really strong executes. Other than that, it's high level players individually, like super, super strong. Yeah, I, I, um, the, to set the scene as well, whenever these CIS teams have, or, or Turkish teams have played previously, like before first strike, so we're talking mid to late 2020, mm -hmm. um, they did not make it deep in tournaments. They made it to a decent level, but they never accomplished that much. Footballers, the top Turkish team right now, played in Red Bull as well. Um, I yeah. think they've had a roster change since then, actually. But I can't even remember where they finished in Red Bull, but I think they bombed out. Did they just they? lose the first round? Someone? Something like that. I Kurt, so. I, I, would you be able to take yeah, a look at that bracket and see, see where footballers finished they in Red Bull? They lost to NIP 3-1. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. All right, they lost to NIP. Yeah, I mean, I thought that NIP played pretty well during that tournament, but at the same time, yeah. There was even it, still NIP in a yeah. pre-NIP now It, it was, but yeah. this is all to say that when they've actually played against top-tier competition in Europe, they have, there has been a losing pattern. This isn't the case that um, Turkey and CIS have always been as good as Europe. If they come out and win here, that would be unusual based on match history. So a lot of this hype is revolving around the, the scrim results. Um, How's but, it going in Overwatch recently? Yeah, I mean, it's not going well in Overwatch. Scrim <laughs> results are not translating oh, okay. into matches in Overwatch. And that's also, to talk about Gambit, I want to hone in on Gambit a little bit here. They have been performing really well in scrims since pff, fucking October, November, whenever the team first formed. I've been hearing people talk about them and how much the EU teams are struggling against them in scrims. And then they never translated it into matches yeah. even against their own domestic talent in CIS. Gambit have only recently become the best team in CIS. They, they struggled at first strike. Forza has actually been the best CIS team. And then uh, Crow Crowd was pretty good, which Durka was from and has now mm -hmm. moved, uh, moved off, so Crow Crowd don't look as good anymore. But um, yeah, Gambit recently won Masters, and then they won this most recent Challengers final. So they're actually being able to do well in the matches now, which is an improvement. But when I watched this team... I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that Gambit's going to come out and sweep everyone. I've got a pretty similar opinion to Bala, actually, where um, their Haven was dog shit. It's their perma ban. They played yes. it in the BO5. Gambit's Haven, they will ban against every single team. <laughs> they will not win it against anybody, even other teams that perma ban Haven, if there even are any, which there aren't, I don't think, in the EMEA finals. They, they, so you already have a map pool advantage because you know immediately Gambit just have a map that they cannot play. On top, uh, apart from that, though, Icebox, to me, looked like their most promising map. They have a really interesting idea playing around the, the cipher here, where they use aggressive cams to defend on A, and a lot of uh, one-way cy cyber cages and that kind of stuff that I think will definitely catch teams off. Because um, it's so unusual. Nobody else plays with a cipher on this map. And if you do, it's it's because you don't know how to play the map. You're playing it like... The only teams that I've seen play Cypher on this map are like fucking T1 when they were just lost in the source, putting down double trips, and then their Cypher was playing passively. Nats is really, really good. Probably probably the best player on their team, actually, the, the Cypher. Mm. And I think he's like... Part of what makes them a very dangerous team to play against is because he's so active and, and uses his utility in good ways. So 
that that's a key component. The other thing that I noticed too is that they rely all of their defensive setups relying on Defo having an op in his hands. And if they end up playing against teams that can punish them and take that away and end up reducing their economy, I think that's going to be a pretty big blow to Gambit uh, because a lot of their strategy is that Defo holds one a one area of the map down. That applies to how they were playing on um, on Icebox, how they were playing on. Uh, on Ascent and how they were playing on Split. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure the Scrimbucks are going to translate here with Gambit, despite the fact that Nookie said they're getting clapped. Uh, the that, wait, did he say they were getting clapped by Gambit? I thought uh, he said that about BBL. Oh, is that what he said? And Gambit. He said both. I think oh, he, he said, said both. both. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the way that he was explaining it, it seemed like there was a bit of hyperbole, like a bit of bigging them up, you yeah. know? And, For but, sure. But I have heard the same thing that like Gambit is wrecking people in scrims when it comes to yeah uh, that kind of gameplay. Now, so yeah, I'm not that convinced on Gambit. I also feel like I'm not even that sold on the individual level of their team. Their, their players are good, uh, but I don't think that they're straight up better than the EU teams that have qualified. I, I had a similar feel. If anything, I actually thought the skill in Turkey was looking. That's what I think. Pretty yeah. good. The skill in Turkey seems to be higher than the skill on Gambit. Yeah. Just from my small period of looking at them. Now, I'm not saying they're bad by any means. Like Jados, Chronicle, and Nats in particular have really high skill. Defo looks good when he has an op in his hands for sure, and he has some great moments with like the rifle occasionally. And Red Guards so are decent, but. You, you guys think that Turkey's individual skill level is higher than that of you? Yes, yeah. definitely. I think okay. when I watch the footballist game against Oxygen, yeah. oh, mama, footballist is good. And Oxygen's not bad either. But players like Toronto for Oxygen and then the, the footballist guys, like Margo, their Jet, and Moj, their yeah. Cypher, are really talented players. Like high, But also, their individual skill comes out more because they play faster tempo. They really mm -hmm. like to be extremely active in post plants. Like, Kurt, if you can find the pistol round on ascent of, um, of that final. So it's like a Brazil situation. You it know, is a they bit have like, like Brazil. very high yeah, skill, it and does feel we like have yet to see them really translate that into international competition and yes. more structured play. Yeah, historically, I, like, and yes, that's how the Turkish teams have been as well. It's been very mm. similar. Yeah, I mean, Sturban is also really talented too. the The entire footballist squad seems like they're really high level. On Oxygen, the pe people to watch for, I think, are Toronto, their Jet, and Glove, who plays Sover and Breach for them. But I just want to point to you, like, it's not just that they're good; it's that they're Finding the right time is to go aggressive. So there you've just got like a pretty nice A-pop and Moj is um, taking the, the cap flank and manages to get a couple of picks. Then Moj repositions into grass and the two guys take heaven control and go into grass to set up. And they're, when they're in an advantage position, they're always still trying to apply pressure, but coordinated pressure. You know, like most teams when they're at an advantage in terms of player numbers, try to slow the round down. Instead, footballists like to group up and keep attacking. Um, and that, that really doesn't allow you opportunities to like isolate 1v1s and win clutches against them, which I think is a very, it's an unusual but really smart way of trying to play those scenarios. And yeah, they're, they're just really fucking good in post plants and like how active they are, how aggressive they are, and their individual skill seems really good. I feel like footballists are the most legit team out of the ones that are being hyped up right now. Um, to do some serious work. Also, Kurt, are you able to bring up like their match win rate or something recently? If you just look, they're on a crazy kind of uh, tempo. Since February, I think they've just been battering everyone in their region, um, you know, including multiple wins over BBL, multiple wins over Oxygen. Um, Have we seen any of yeah. these CIS or uh, Turkey teams on to patch 2.06 yet? Or have no. they just been? I know CIS was on 2.05. No, I don't know they about were, all of the. Okay, all so of we Europe actually don't know on the, like, the new meta. No, we have no mm. idea how much Viper is going to get played. We don't know if teams are going to be playing Yoru like Brazil. It's that's going to be a big curveball that gets that thrown crazy. into the mix. Yeah, uh, I, I I asked the individual skill question about Turkey because I, I I don't have that much about Turkey, but I did watch CIS and and from my what Gambit the impression for me with Gambit was that. They are deep at a high level and, and even or 
maybe higher than than EU on some of their players, but every one of them were super solid except for their omen. And I forgot what else he Red played. Gun. Redgar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other than that, all four players were un were, were not. I'm not going to say that they're, they're they're higher, but I think they were at a level that that will compete in EU for sure. And I think that the scrims represent that. Some of the yeah. stuff that Chronicle was doing, absolutely yeah, ridiculous. Nasty. I mean, even on the map that they lost, I just like he pulls out the most r ridiculous round, yeah. um, just by himself. And they're coordinated, right? Definitely. I think in terms of like individual skill, when we we talk about it, a lot of times. It doesn't come with uh, a level of coordination with others, right? And to me, Gambit had that more than anything else. They were every time they did a peak, every time they did something purposeful, there was something else behind it, right? It felt Vision Strikers, but it was also not set. It was not set up. It was not planned. It was just on the fly type of things, right? It wasn't part of a grand execution, but that that always gets me gets me excited. Um, yeah. Oh, so I had the. Um... I've had for a while, actually, the, the coach of Footballist hanging out in my Twitch chat while I've been doing these VOD reviews as well. And I, I mean, this is the first time that I've really taken a deep dive into Footballist. And he was in my chat last night just trying to, you know, explain a, a few things of like how they play, why they play them, that kind of stuff. And nice. uh, so the, the IGLs for both of these teams as well, it's Mitez for Oxygen, who plays the Omen for them, but then transitions into playing Reyna when it gets to Icebox, I think that's what happened. Something like that. And then it's, uh, shit, who was it? I think it's um, Sasuke it um, for Footballist as well. Yeah. Sick name. Yeah. <laughs> That's from an anime, right? Probably. Yeah, so you ever heard of Naruto? No. Pretty what is it? Is that uh, one yeah, the one where they have the headbands and they run like this? Yeah. Yeah, Pretty Sasuke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Pretty good. Yeah, so I'm <laughs> I'm buying into the scrim bucks for Turkey, but I'm not buying into them for CIS. I also think that it's just like a bit of a numbers game where, okay, Gambit, the first team they go up against is FPX. And oh yeah, let's look at the bracket. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Can we take a look at the bracket actually, <sighs> Kurt? And, prediction. And, I mean, Auction has to play new fanatic. Yeah, new, next which topic. Is EMA predictions. Um, let's take a look at the bracket and we'll kind of talk through some of the the stuff that's going on there because yeah, Gambit first open match. against FPX. My lord. I don't think I definitely don't. I mean, I'll just go right ahead and say that FPX wins that match. <laughs> FPX wins that match. Like, go. I'll just say that right off the bat. Yeah, yeah I think Gambit is going to be guess. very good against execute heavy type of teams. I don't think EU has that much, that many of them. That's kind of why I rate them slightly lower. And I think FPX is probably on the the high end of that execute heavy style. But they're so flexible. They're they so flexible. flexible. FPX is just like. Their mid rounds are insane. They speed up tempos. They slow it down. They go on the fly all the time. Um, I think this is a really hard matchup for for anybody to predict anything. And yeah. FPX has not been playing for a week. They get this extra time to play with Viper and such, yeah. which raises them up for me. Yep. I Especially I given well. that they've run Viper so much in the past. Yeah, the, the fact too that Gambit just have to ban Haven and FPX don't have a map that they're really weak on. They can pick and choose what they want to ban. They could either ban, you know, like Icebox because Gambit are really good there or they can ban Bind because Gambit are pretty good there and FPX are, you know, still working through some stuff. Or if they have some really cool strat for Bind, they could ban Ascent if they don't feel like their style of taking mid is going to work very well against Gambit. It's just the tactics are open so much to them and I feel like it's pretty clear cut to me from watching Gambit play that FPX are the better team on split and then are they able to win one of the other maps whatever that ends up being yeah probably I feel like that's a bit I, I would be very surprised if Gambit came out with a win here I, I think that they would have to really reproduce whatever magic they've been doing in scrims and hasn't they haven't so far been doing in matches whatever the fuck they've been doing in scrims that's been booming people they would have to bring that shit out in this game to be able to Take this one. I dare I say it, but I believe in FPX for this tournament. I I believe the momentum is building. The momentum <laughs> is in fact building, and uh, they only need to make top two as well, yeah. right? Like they don't need to win; they just have to make ice. I mean, surely this is their first major Valorant title, right? Fucking hell! <laughs> you <gone>. just <laughs> you just love to jinx it, don't you? Yes. No, but come on, right? 
This I mean, has got to be the one. It, it I might... think this is such a cool match, though, for for all the mysteriosity around. Is that even a word? No. Mysteriousness. No, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I the, like with it all though. the mysterious around Gambit, like <laughs> for them to go up against FPX first is such a cool concept yeah. to me. Like everybody should have their eyes on this match. Yeah, um, it's because... also the clash of CIS because FPX yes. in theory could be playing in the CIS region if they wanted mm -hmm. to. Angel could decide. Because he's from Ukraine, and Ukrainian people get to choose whether they want to compete in uh, EU or CIS. So he could say next week, well, maybe not next week. I don't know exactly when, like how much. Fuck it. The details don't matter. The point is, we get the point. they're basically Friday. a CIS team. <laughs> it's a cool matchup. BBL Liquid, why do I feel like there's upset potential, but I know absolutely nothing about BBL? BBL, I didn't get to watch their vlogs yeah, last night. I didn't get to watch them. I the last time impressed. I watched BBL was when CNED was still on the team. I know that Aslan Mafor Shadow, whatever the fuck, however yeah. you're supposed to say his name. <laughs> I Wait, know that... His name is, oh my goodness. Yeah, Aslan Mafor yeah. Shadow. I know he's, I know he's pretty damn good. And I know that this team is still pretty talented, but they are the third best team in Turkey right now. Yeah, and so surely not, right? So... Without any good knowledge, I'm going to say Liquid should be able to win that game, I think. <laughs> but, but I do no think that knowledge. his name is so good. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a coin flip, though. Foreshadow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, feel like that... I mean, this... To me as well, though, Liquid rely on Scream playing really well. If, if Scream has a life game, they can beat anybody. On sure. at least one map, because he normally only brings that kind of performance to one map, and then maybe you can squeak it out over the rest of the series, and they can upset anyone. But the normal level of Scream is really high and enough to carry you through games like this, usually. If Scream underperforms and BBL pops off, yeah, of course there's a world in which they get upset here. Or Yampy just... Int. Yeah, I mean... In... Int, yeah. like he's never inted before. Yeah. Just feeds but, harder than we've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, I mean... I suppose you have to go with the logical choice is liquid. Yeah. But I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility that BBL win this game. And then because it's GSL style brackets, we might as well close it out. FPX liquid. I mean, are we... FPX just win this bracket. FPX right, have yeah, to win yeah. this bracket, right? Yeah. How do they even come in FPX... second? I but guess if they lose to Gambit. Here's, but... here's my hot take, though. I went through this bracket last night on my stream. Oh, I, no. think, I think uh, if we assume that BBL because they're the third best team in Turkey, end up getting eliminated by both Liquid and Gambit, sure. right? Like, we don't know whether that'll be the case, but if we see Gambit and Liquid clash in the bottom end of the bracket... He's going to say it. I'm going to pred Gambit for that game. He said it. Yeah, because <laughs> Ooh. Gambit's permaban of Haven hurts Liquid, and Liquid's permaban of... Yeah. Or not permaban, but Liquid's normal ban of Split helps Gambit, because it's probably... It's like the weakest, in my opinion, watching their games. It's the weakest of the maps that they play. So when you end up on a map pool that's a scent, bind, an ice box, Gambit are loving that, and Liquid aren't wow. particularly. No, they're really not, are so they? So I am, I am liking Gambit's chances if they end up playing against Liquid there. That's I think a very it's, good point. I think it's quite likely, and the safe bet might be, that both of the EU teams make it through. But I, I'm actually going to predict FPX and Gambit making it through this. I think it's a CIS group at the top. That is a good, that's a great point about the maps. Specifically, yeah, God, I mean, I have no confidence in Liquid on Bind still. And then, I mean, they if, squeaked it out against BB, BDS, but yeah, can they and, really and that replicate was a, that, that again? That was a miracle. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point. I, 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 I would agree. You've uh, convinced me. Of course, so much of it is still up in the air. It's still rampant speculation. Absolutely. <laughs> I, don't, yep. I don't know. I don't know. I've been, the, I've been an early holder of new liquid stocks with the Ampy, so I just have to commit to it or else I, I lose my long position. So, <laughs> you know, I just have to say liquid probably beats Gambit. You can't so. sell off halfway. Yeah, no. I can't sell off. I, I, have to, I have to stay in for the time being. So I'm just going to say that liquid still stays in. Because actually, I can't even argue with that logic. Like the map pool's not good for them. Like Gambit look not bad honestly like they definitely look like they can compete at least against some, against the european teams so yeah that's just that's honestly just me sticking to my guns i'm just sticking sure. to my guns on that one can't be mad at that no i i i think that gambit's play is a little like i don't i don't think that they're i think team liquid is bringing out more variety and new stuff than gambit is and i don't see them implementing anything new for this 
either. Um, and I think that favors Liquid because Gambit is going to have to face against something that potentially they're not playing against too much, especially in officials. And I think that will, you know, switch it up for them because yeah. from what we saw, it was like literally the same thing that we've been watching for for months. Yeah, there was no uh, Astro involved in Gambit stuff. There was there was no indication that they were going to play anything interesting or new. Simple. Also. All of the sky meta that started happening in Europe has completely yep, missed happening. CIS and Turkey. Well, Neither like of a, those regions are playing that. It's like a week long fucking group. I didn't notice that. It's they it's because oh, yeah, it starts like, this weekend. Yeah, they got six days off. Yeah, they the get first two games. Yeah, so <laughs> you can nuts. you the one team will get eliminated from each group in the first week. Yeah, and then yep. the next team to get eliminated has you have like a whole week to prep on the new patch yeah. before the next one. So oh my God. the the All main right. thing to avoid is getting eliminated in that first week. Sure. Um, let's take a look at the next bracket though, because this one is really fucking interesting. I mean, you talk about the previous one being crazy. This one is crazy because. I got nothing I, on this I, uh, <laughs> Dude, I am fucking <laughs> losing it here. Uh, what, what, Josh, what makes this bracket so damn crazy? Who the Break fuck wins between Footballist and Guild? I don't know. Who wins that game? Guild are such a sleeper team right now. They are. Uh, but Footballist have got enough explosive um, power on the entirety of their roster, enough coordination, and like... Good. They're, they're like a well, a well strategized and coordinated, like well coached team, you know, where they just know what their plan is in all of the games. They also have a deep map pool. They don't, they don't perma ban anything. I don't think. Yeah. So and it looks like they have the firepower to, to line up with. Yeah. It seems safe. Is safe going to be back on Viper for patch two point zero six? Oh, maybe. That'd Who be, knows? That'd be pretty cool. I mean, this entire bracket is unpredictable. I think, like yeah. in the. <laughs> I, I mean, I, yeah. Fnatic stocks are up. That's about all I have right now. <laughs> I feel, I feel good in Fnatic. I feel good, but with Fnatic still, based off this last uh, bit of run for them. So I feel good on Fnatic against Oxygen. Even though I know you just went on this whole like, actually, this is a secret superpower that's been slumbering like Wakanda, and no one knows it exists, and like Turkey's <laughs> about to like pop off. Like sure, but I. I, I still feel like Fnatic stocks are looking really yeah. good. So no, I, I'm going to go with Fnatic for, against Oxygen. I don't know I'm, about football. I have no idea about football. Yeah, I mean, no I'm, I'm a big Fnatic believer. I'm Fnatic I, as well. I just don't know who's going to win that Footballist Guild game. And I don't know who's going to get out of the... Like, who the hell gets out How of this How about Footballist Fnatic? If that's the winner's matchup. Let's just assume. I See, the, the reason why I'm tipping in favor of Fnatic is because I like that they always try new shit, and I think the Viper-Astra combo is actually going to be nasty on this patch. I know yeah. that NA hasn't really been doing it too much, but I think that's because the teams hadn't put the time in previously to learning how to play Viper. EU's already done that, and Fnatic's already done that groundwork, you know? Yep. So implementing it on more maps is not going to be as much of a challenge. They're going to have that kind of way of thinking about the game already already in their heads. I, I, yeah, I feel like Fnatic gets a buff from this upcoming patch, but honestly, yeah, I, 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 I think if I had to... Yes, I think Fnatic makes it through that game, but I don't know. I, I'm confident in Fnatic in this bracket, period. Yeah. I, I really am. New Fnatic. I, I think they're, they're going to make it through. But it's just, it's the next team. I, uh, football uh, is skilled. I, I don't I'm know. getting too too much hype vibes from from Josh over here. Too much scrim bucks. I have no freaking clue what to say for football is guild. Guild's already a team that I I never have much. I to mean, say also about just anyways. the traditional run of teams is that like, especially regions that have traditionally been weaker, it always requires some you know some Magic. forging, some hardening on the international fires of competition to get them up to speed where their sure. their skill like really brings them to be a tier one region. And there just hasn't been a lot of cross-regional play still with Turkey, right? Like we yeah, still haven't seen a lot of cross-regional play. So it's just his, based off historical trends, even if there is the skill there, they generally need to face what better strategized or like better run and all rounded squads from like Europe or North America to generally bring these regions up to the point where like they are now tier one and they are like a real competitor. Well, generally, they, that's how, well, it how about this then? 
if footballist loses that opening game to guild which you know would would fit into that narrative of they just need more experience they probably win against oxygen right so they're probably still going to move on and have another week to kind of look at their games see what they need to fix that kind of stuff who the hell even gets knocked down into that lower game against them out of fanatic against guild i mean that's a fucking slobber knocker of a game too guild but i I, uh, but it's so close that's really close (laughs) so close though And, and then whoever gets knocked down you're you're going up against a footballist that's had a week to kind of prep yeah. against you and look at your games okay. and that kind of shit. I've been convinced, Fuck though. I'm convinced now to go with Guild in the first round. That was some airtight logic from the man in the himbo hat <laughs> yeah. that, that I simply have to believe I mean, it's in. just, it's just, it's it's just true. history, it, you yeah, know? Yeah, it is it's historically just, it, would, it would be an incredible upset that defies, like, general trends if yeah. football is right. to win. You're right. Or Oxygen. You're right. I, you convinced me. I, this is where magic happens, though, bro. This is this. This is the. I first... mean, look at this bracket compared to North America, man. I'm like, oh. It's what yeah, we, we okay. We're not at that stage yet. We're not. I know we're not at that stage. I'm just thinking so, about like looking forward there. to the immediate future. It's just like crazy to think about. I'm gonna. Be, this is gonna be the immediate future for Europe. And well, then... you also <laughs> we're, that we're assuming here that the CIS and Turkish teams are actually gonna be competitive. If all of this yeah. is wrong yeah. and they just flump and all, and it's just free wins for everyone who plays against CIS and Turkey, then this bracket ends up looking a lot shittier in the, with the benefit <laughs> of hindsight. Yeah, very true. But I do think they're gonna be competitive. I think that if a team like Footballist was competing in Europe right now, they previously were hanging around like the eighth position back when they actually were playing against competition, like Oxygen Footballist, they were around that eighth. I think they've improved since then. They're, they're probably hanging around the top five position. You know, I would rate footballists at the same kind of tier as teams like Liquid, BDS, that kind of thing, which makes this group interesting because Fnatic and Guild are probably a step above that. So if footballists manage to get out, they've proven even more than I'm expecting. Uh, I, I think this is sick. I think this is also a uh, worst case scenario if Turkey ends up dominating everybody because their region's already popular and Europe needs more viewers. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. It's like, this is going to be the first time Europe really gets any viewers, man. If there's any time for Turkey to pop off for, for I mean, BBL even on the other brackets, like, it's going to be this weekend. It's going to be the first time they actually face up. This is going to be when all their fans are riled up and ready to to take down the EU. Yeah, I think yeah. that there's a lot of motivation behind it, and I actually go go against the like the historical grain that that Avast is talking about. I think that these initial bouts are when smaller regions end up popping off. Like it it happens this way in my mind. It's like for for however long um, in CS, whenever there's this first time that this region is playing in the major or whatever, it's always like, well, they're probably gonna flop. And then they just come out swinging and they're crazy. It's not even like they're they're that good. It's just for some reason they have magic behind them. I, and teams don't know how to play against them because it's unusual. I, I suppose though that the EU teams are actually scrimming against them. It's not like everyone's playing against Brazil where they've had no interaction with them or Korea yeah. where they've had no yeah. interaction with them. Yeah. I think it's going to be a really good tournament though as well. And it makes me excited for the North American version of it because that's also where we're going to see some sicko stuff happening in NA. I just can't wait to see who makes it to Iceland, man. I just can't fucking wait. Yep. I hope it's a great crop of teams, but I don't see how it couldn't be. Do you guys know that the LATAM finals, where where one team comes out of Latin Latin America, they're playing a head-to-head match on LAN, like after all their Challengers finals things. Really? Wow. They're trying to get that 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 done in Mexico City. Yep. That's that's pretty cool. That is wild. That's bizarre, (laughs) actually. Okay. I mean, that's really cool. I'm just so hyped. Really? It's just because it's stuff I mean, like if it's that, just, man, just two random teams, things right? out of this. It's just yeah. the head-to-head for the two. So they have the they have out. the regular eight challenger, eight team challenger final, and then the the people who get to the grand final are going to be flown yeah. to Mexico oh, City. Oh, because play it's Adelaide. Latam North and Latam South, so exactly. they're not actually yeah. in the same region. They would have what presumably ping differences or something that would make it mm-hmm. a bit annoying to play online. Dude, mm-hmm. that's really that's really cool. Actually, that is really yeah. cool. It's also very doable logistically since it's just two teams. The the, the thing is, they, they released something like that. That was the original plan, but COVID has gotten worse. So there they might not be, especially I think if it's a, like a team that makes it out of Black Time South is from Venezuela, I want to say. One of those right. countries is like locking down hard. Right. Um, so they might not be able to do it. But Fair enough. I mean, you can only do what you can do at the moment. So yeah, yep. I, I'm excited that we've even got to this stage this early on in the year. Yeah. I am fucking hyped. It's going to be sick, and it happens in like a month and a bit, and I'm already excited. All right. 
Most important segment of the show, coming right up. Mm. What you got for us, Mr. Wyatt? Or roll the tape. But you've seen this trophy before. (laughs) Wyatt's Weekly Award. But who's getting it this time? Mm. This time? It's going to Boaster. Mm. I mean, surely he deserves it, right? Nice little turnaround from Fnatic. He's been there since the beginning. He built the first roster. Rose up with Summon. Nice run in first strike, second place. After that, though, signed by Fnatic. Things not looking so hot. Mm -hmm. Couple roster changes. Dirk, Magnum in. And all of a sudden, Fnatic back right up at the top. And potentially looking to to eclipse what Summon had uh, done before in first strike. And a lot of the credit needs to go to Boaster. Um, And and even just aside from being the in-game leader and very dedicated in terms of spending time in the server here he is singing the tomato town Fortnite song <laughs> but I'm gonna get audio. yes please get some audio yes please <laughs> um uh but not only does he put the time in in the server to actually bring a unique look to the utility that's used for the team fanatic the overarching strategy but also recently he's just been really good he's been popping he's been popping uh, uh, as an individual so Deserves a lot of credit for, for what he's done for the team, both as an individual and as a leader. Hurt roll the tape again. <laughs> I guess he's a Tomato Town fan, huh? Not a retail just, row type no, of guy. Just warming up in DM, listening to a little Tomato Town. <laughs> Will you chug jug with me? He's but officially then, lost. At the end of it, he's like... Um, he changes the lyrics to be talking about shock darts as well at the end. <laughs> He's got his own original <laughs> yeah. rendition that's about to drop. Yeah. That's actually a I great idea. Um, Holy shit. Make a, a no, Valorant but, version? Yeah, I mean, we couldn't do it. We're no, lame. We're untalented. We're no talent, old, lame. But if, but if Boaster, Boaster has does time does off. It, yeah. yeah. If but, Boaster has time off to do that, he's the exact person to actually make there that was also, and, it be, and it worked. There was also a clip. I don't know whether it was on Boaster or Yinsu's Twitch of them talking to the camera and answering questions from the chat from this week. And um, people were asking Boaster about his music career. And they, they asked him a question, something like, if it doesn't work out for you in gaming, are you going to go into theater? Is that, like, is that like something that you would be interested in? And Yinsu was explaining it was the other way around. He was, he was trying to do theater and it just didn't work out for him. So he went into being a gamer. And, and Boaster kind of nods and then he looks at the camera and he goes, yeah, it just didn't work out. Uh, my... Uh, my penis is too big, so when I tried to get in the tight <laughs> costumes, it just shows. And, and Yitsu said, Yitsu said, no, no, it's your balls. <laughs> and I just, the, the fucking, the duo of them is just chaotic energy constantly. <laughs> like, Yinsu's just recording him singing Tomato Town. They're on stream talking about how his fucking cock and balls won't fit into theater costumes. What the fuck is going on in that house? It seems like fun. <laughs> I just like, I'm did you cut. find the clip he wants that too josh wants that like why doesn't everyone ever talk about my balls not fitting into spandex where where is it you know that, that's what he wants it was just it's just i don't know it just had me it had me creased watching the clip is this oh, it Kurt? We have may 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 um if he fail as a valorant it was all no it's more like you didn't succeed in musicals then you became yeah. a gamer it's the other way around guys the problem was i had yeah. too much of a big penis so then i couldn't wear <laughs> any of the costumes can't relate it's balls babe balls. it's yeah, your balls i couldn't it's wear balls. any of the costumes so i couldn't get any parts <laughs> yeah that but, was my problem but you guys <laughs> it's, just, toys, it's such I... a low-key roast from yinsu she just looks at him and she's like it's not your cock it's your balls <laughs> What? it's so <laughs> fucking good she says can't relate as well <laughs> I don't know, something about that clip is something fucking dying. Uh, All right, well. That's pretty good. Any other press, any like, uh, Kurt, any news drop? Are we missing anything? Did they like release anything about the new map again? Any, probably. Any more screenshots? Probably a new agent already at? in the game. Oh, did the lead developer leave right as yeah. we dropped the show? Did that happen? <laughs> oh, yeah. So what, what is Jeff Kaplan leaving? Is yeah. this a big win did, for Valorant? Did Jeff Kaplan join the Valorant <laughs> team while we were live? Are people just trying to fuck us over again in terms of dropping the news? I don't... I, I'm not seeing anything on the timeline. 
Good. Currently. All right. Well, then, well, let's then we are out. safe uh, to close uh, out. I need to get some lunch. Yeah. Thanks for joining us for this episode, episode 41 of Plaid Chat Valorant. Um, we, I'm sure people will be doing co-streams for various different things that are yeah, coming I'll up, right? Yeah, I'll be co-streaming all of NA. Yeah, on Wyatt's channel. I don't know what Avast is up to. I think he's just co-streaming. Are you Overwatch casting balls? Are you doing... You, I'm also um, Not or sure, probably doing? not, if I don't have news at this point, so... <laughs> right, okay. Well, well, we'll just be chilling then. Bala might be doing... Are you doing your own co-stream or something then, Bala? I'll probably hop in with Wyatt. Uh, at some right. point, if I'm not casting. Well, sweet. Sounds you can catch good. that. And then we'll have another back chat episode coming out you next week, which, again, I think it's going to be with Bone Cold, but we're still working out the details, so it might be with somebody else. But we'll see. <laughs> uh, take a look at that. Subscribe to the YouTube. About half of you are not subscribed, so go and sub. Don't just watch our videos and have That's them pop appalling. up and you recommend it. I know. I know. Horrific, isn't Disheartening. it? Disheartening. So go and hit that button. Go tell your friends to hit the button and then come back next week. Bye.